Some important numbers this weekend. Michael Caruso, 100th round start, 200th round start for Greg Murphy. But there's a string of numbers attached to this racetrack as well. Mark Scaife, talk us through it. It's a great racetrack, Neil, isn't it? It's a very unforgiving, very different style of circuit. It's got really good combination of fast stuff and some slower, very tricky chicanes and corners onto those long straights. 265 kilometres an hour is the maximum speed and 245k up to the fast chicane at the back of the track. On board now with one of the nine cars that we've got covered this weekend for you. That's Paul Dumbrell. High stress location as well. It's the number one in terms of bumps because of the, all of the curb hopping, so it smashes suspension. We've got to keep an eye on that. And it's number two of the 14 locations that we go to in terms of brake stress. Yes. And you heard the boys talking earlier about the fact that the expectation is, as we look at David Russell here in the Jack Daniels Nissan Altima, that they're going to have to manage tyres very, very carefully in this race because of the new rules regarding minimum tyre pressures. That's Steve Owen, Pepsi Max Ford Performance Racing. This is going to be a frantic and busy race. Uh, the tone of it at this event is typically set by the first few laps as well. Alex Davison, Erebus Motorsport, E63. Let's have a look at the Fuso starting grid to get race number 31 underway for our championship series. Shane Van Gisbergen, he's on the pole. VIP Pet Foods alongside the Scotty McLaughlin number 33 Volvo. The second row of the grid, it'll be Slade and Delberta. That's a mighty performance. And then Tander and Luff. What a recovery for those guys after Bathurst out of position number four. Row three, positions five and six. Series leader and reigning champion, Jamie Wincup, with the Dunlop Series champion of this year, Paul Dumbrell, together with Reynolds and Canto. They were winners here last year. Nick Perkat and Oliver Gavin on the podium last time out at Mount Panorama for third position. They'll start from seventh. And Michael Caruso, Dean Fiori alongside them from nine. Remember, this is a change. Lee Holdsworth and Craig Baird. And then from ten, Craig Lowndes, after not recording a time, you heard from him a little earlier. He's with veteran Stephen Richards, who's doing really well in the Carrera Cup. Mark Winterbottom and Steve Owen, Pepsi Max Ford Performance Racing. Rick Kelly, David Russell. Then it's Fabian Coulthard and Luke Yildon, position 13. James Courtney and Greg Murphy for Murph. It's his 200th V8 supercar event. That's a nice round number. David Wall and Stevie Johnson, so unfortunate for Stephen up at Mount Panorama with that transmission drama for him. He was devastated. He wants to make amends this weekend. Taz Douglas and James Moffat, second at Bathurst. What can they produce today? The brothers Davison, Will and Alex out of 17. And then it's Swedish driver Robert Dahlgren and Greg Ritter next out of position 18. Chaz Mostert and Paul Morris. And it's back to earth with the thud as they've got to work their way through from 19. Todd Kelly, an Englishman, Alex Buncombe. From 21, it's Jack Perkins and Cam Waters in the Geldwin entry and extra support this weekend from Surf Life Saving Queensland. Scotty Pye and Ash Walsh out of 22. Then 23 will be Dale Wood and Chris Pither, another of the cars that's had major repair work done together with its sister car there being driven by Jason Bright and Andrew Jones. And they had an engine change, by the way, last night in car number eight. And then out of 25 in a borrowed car. And I asked Russell about it for Russell Ingle and Tim Blanchard. I said, what's it like? And he just said, different. It's yeah. really different. Different behaviour in the car. They've got to understand how to get the most out of it and tune it right. So that's a process for them this weekend. Greg Murphy on board there driving with James Courtney. And we think there's five of the regular drivers starting in the field. Ingle, Bright, Pye, Dahlgren, McLaughlin. Yeah, and what's going to be interesting, Scapey, at the start, what you notice is different to all the other championship events we do. As they come up, it's like a Formula One grid. It's staggered. So instead of being row by row, they stagger them like this. So it creates a little bit more room if you're going to get start, a good start, sorry, to tuck in. The other thing it'll do is allow other people to come in and single file down into the chicane. But you know what? Oh, gee whiz, look at that. That's very lucky. He's gone over the line. Look at that. He can, yeah, he can come up about another metre. Remember, his wheels can't go over the line, the front of the car again. Very, very lucky. They'll get in single file into the chicane, but you know what? I reckon it won't make a difference. That was an awkward moment then for Jonathan Webb. You've got to grab that little selector on the gear lever to be able to engage, reverse with these cars with a new transaxle system in them. Had these new generation cars since the beginning of the last season as the tail enders now find their way into position. We'll sort out who's driving what for you shortly. We're looking at Paul Dumbrell over his left shoulder. He's still in neutral. The N on the dashboard. 
when he gets the timing signal he'll engage first gear he should engage first gear there it is clunk we're set for a start jonathan webb has the pole position green means go for car number one and paul dumbrell's done a nice job but we've got a huge problem here for the hrt car 22 to be turned around and that car will need to be cleared or it'll trigger an immediate Petters safety car a jostling through turn two Murphy. Don't believe it. So there was a big push and shove between the HRT car and David Reynolds through the first chicane as well. Meantime, Webb has cleared out. Then it's McLaughlin, then Dumbrell, then Dalberto, then Canto, Luff, Gavin, Baird, Fiore. That's the early order. And there was push and shove with Dumbrell when he tried to get through the gap there, Neil. So there was contact with the HRT car and Dumbrell very early. Great start with McLaughlin and a very good start also for John Webb. Safety car, I can hear Tim Schenken's voice in the background. Race director. Adrian Burgess. So here, onboard shots, Greg Murphy. So we caught a glimpse of that car pointed the wrong direction off the start, 200th event. Let's look towards the back end of the grid here, see what happens. Ah, uh, he tripped oh. over the Jack Daniels car. So he's tripped over car number 15. And it's David Russell in that car. Here we are on board with Murph. Oh, it's because the, he actually bobbled at the start, David Russell. So what Greg had to do was drop the clutch, pull to the left, try and get around him as he tucked back in. It was right at the moment that David got the launch and the secondary part of the start. The chopper tells more of the story there. There's an auto start mechanism in the cars. I don't know whether he actually stalled it, David, David but you can depress both pedals and actually kickstart the thing again. And I'd say just as it's launched, which Greg didn't anticipate because you wouldn't because he thought the thing was stationary. That's right. He's launched and tripped over it. And, and there's very strange here because car nine has stayed out on the track instead of coming through the pit lane. They're all screaming over the radios as to what the policy is because they've purposely with the Petters SRT safety car they've dragged the field through the pit lane to get it off the start pretty straight where Greg Murphy's still stricken but they've left car nine still out there it's strange and the reason they tour the pit lane is just for safety because there are officials on the racetrack there and we've seen it in years gone by at different locations that safety car will roll down the pit lane and keep everybody away from wherever the area of the incident may be Let's go to Rihanna. James Pointy, hugely disappointing start to your Gold Coast 600 campaign. You've seen a replay. Just give us your thoughts. <laughs> Definitely not what we uh, what we wanted. So, look, it, uh, it all probably started with me tagging the wall this morning, uh, putting us back with with those guys that really we shouldn't be with. So, it, um, look, it's look, it's racing. It's here. It's so tight off the start, but um, yeah, I just feel for Murph, poor little fella. So. Uh, See if we can get it back in and put a corner back in it and see how we go. But uh, unfortunately, I think today's done for us. Thanks. We just saw another replay then, and one of the things about this, just let's go with this is on board with Greg. So he's moved out of the way because of the drama. Then as he was sort of, he was bunched up between the Lockwood car. He tried to come across, and he just caught the left front as the other car moved. He didn't know. No that this was going to move, just there. Well, not only is the 15 car then mobile as Greg tries to tuck back to the right, but he also moved very slightly to the left, I noticed on that Gillette replay. So, very early in the piece, the Petters Chrysler safety car has been deployed. It's a tricky location. We'll get it all tidied up and come back and a restart for you in a moment. Hey, uh, 
um, Spud, that was looked awfully unlucky, mate. Looks like you. Great start, got around Russell. He went just as you tucked it around and he tagged you. Yeah, I... Something like that, I don't know. He, yeah, he... Expecting a restart at the end of this lap, mate. It's a great location. The Gold Coast. We're in southeastern Queensland for race 31 of the championship. It's the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600. Look at that spectacular beach looking down towards the south and just tucked in behind it is three kilometres of racetrack for the V8 supercars this afternoon and we're already under the control of the Petters Chrysler safety car sadly because Greg Murphy uh, tangled with David Russell off the start. An uh, awkward situation because it looked like David had stalled his car and then when he relaunched he just ended up tagging the back of the Holden Racing Team Commodore with more on that. We've got Mark Larkham down there. Hey, um, Spud, that was looked awfully unlucky, mate. Looks like you... Great start, got around Russell. He went just as you tucked in around and he tagged you. Yeah, I... Something like that. I don't know. He, yeah, he balked and didn't get away. And I was uh, going past him on the you know, on the left and Jordan didn't get away well either. And um, so then after that, I'm not sure what happened. So I don't know if I moved on him or, or not. I, I don't know. I'm going to say, mate, looking at the vision, I'd just say you were damn unlucky. Shit happens. Yeah, so Greg Murphy there, and it's the second year in a row that he's had trauma at this race meeting as well. Remember, they had a very difficult outing at Mount Panorama. They had an intermittent problem with the electricals. First of all, they had dash dramas and then misfires, and they tried different wiring looms, and they tried to change the steering wheel, and nothing really resolved it. Then they thought that it was a ignition sensor issue, and it turned out later when they got it back and did the post-mortem in the workshop, it was actually a wiring connector problem. But uh, great frustration for them. They did get James back out. They did get some valuable points at, at Mount Panorama, but this is not a good start. Remember, he's equal fourth in the championship with Shane Van Gisbergen, and that's the car of Shane's there being driven by Jonathan Webb. Now you can see the lights have gone out on the Peters Chrysler safety car. So at the moment, in that little tussle for fourth in the championship, it's advantage Van Gisbergen and Webb over Courtney and Murphy, and the implication here is also for the Pertec Enduro Cup. There's quite stringent rules here in terms of the overlap, single file, and uh, where they can overlap as they make their run down towards the, the straight. We loosely use the term straight because it isn't. It's got a, it's a huge big, curve in big it. Curve in it, exactly. Very, very fast. 265 kilometres an hour. The thing about that and the start line incident, Neil, shows what the consequences are in terms of the championship here. 300 points for today's 300 kilometre race. Oh, 150, sorry. 300 points for the weekend. So when you when you have this drama going, oh, oh. what's going on there? So terrible start there what for then? Jonathan Webb. And that was very strange. That's got us dumbfounded. We'll try and find out why. Did he just miss it? Or has someone jumped the gun? Paul Dumbrell may have jumped the gun. I don't really understand that. We'll need to see it in replay. They're shooting every which way down here. McLaughlin's taken the inside curving at two. Now he's trying to go down the inside of Webb, which he's done. And he... He's oh, the redressing. He's redressing. So Dumbrell's moving back. Yeah. Okay. Because you can't pass before the start finish line. You pass the control line, but you can't pass. So he rounded them up, and now he's just redressed. So that was very, very clumsy. 
that was my hunch, but until oh. you sometimes see it in replay, because there's so many cars to focus on, but that seemed all out of whack. So now there's a restoration of something like order. It's McLaughlin and Webb and Dumbrell. Oh, oh. trouble up here at 11 as well. Boys are going to need to be able to play a longer game here. They've got to, it's easy to say from afar, but uh, if you get involved in too much of this early in the game here, you just come up with a donut and no points. He's got a broken right front suspension there for Oliver Gavin. You just see the drama there. He'll have trouble to get back to the left of the road here because he's on the wrong side of the road coming out of the final corner and he's got to get to the extreme left. It's an awesome shot. Full tilt, sixth gear, 265 kilometres an hour. And Ollie did get in in car triple two. So he's made it into the lane. So damage for him that needs rectification. McLaughlin, Webb, Dumbrell. Lucky Paul dealt with that quickly because that would have been jumped on. Here's the Gillette replay. Shows us what happened here. So they're under the control of Jonathan Webb. He's got the call here. And they must have called on the... Because Paul Dumbrell would have taken his cues from the radio call, I imagine. And then, of course, as soon as Dumbrell went, that meant McLaughlin said, well, I'm buying a ticket to this ride. Yeah. And he went as well. But at this point, Webb's the one that's actually got control. So this is a pretty telling shot. I don't know what happened with Peter. He would have been cued, I'm sure. Either that or he just got a bit excited and bolted. On board, just check this out. You know what I reckon? He probably, he may well have thought that there was a problem with Jonathan Webb, because the other thing is, Jonathan, and you would only know by looking at the data post-race, is supposed to maintain pace. It almost seemed as though he slowed up a bit there, and if he slowed up, that may have been what he thought was a problem with the car. These are stories to uh, get to the bottom of later in the day. <laughs> Basically, you've got a hold your speed and once you go you've got to go and continue with the acceleration run you can't accelerate stop accelerate stop because it creates the sort of chaos that we just saw we just saw so we're looking down at the coat tire chopper shot of the northern end of the track and one of the things about this in terms of strategy that we've just got to contemplate is the Scott McLaughlin move to start the race so as we said there were five guys who are the lead drivers start of this race McLaughlin now has been able to get by he's leading Webb and Dumbrell in terms of a move it may actually just de-risk the start of this race a little bit there's got to be a reason and at the moment that little gap is the reason that Richard Holway and the team have decided to start Scott McLaughlin like her. Yeah Scott for you just to add to that I, I think in their instance it's not a bad move at all I mean the risk is always in these ones if you get a safety car uh, from here on in, he'll lose that benefit. But what he's got to do now is make time, give himself a good breather. But I reckon the trick to this little strategy is they've got Alex Premer to put in the car in the middle. Now, there's plenty of good co-drivers out there, but Alex has done a couple of seasons here now. So if there's one guy you could throw in to combat the main drivers when they go out, it's Alex Premer. And you can put Scotty in back at the end of the day. So I reckon half smart. I, I totally agree. And Premer, really, with the experience he's got in the cars, He's probably one of the better co-drivers. He did a really good job at Bathurst. And that will, in terms of outright speed, I think serve them well. The only thing it does is when you did the race facts at the start, it does tend to hurt you from a strategy standpoint if the safety car comes out at the wrong time frame. In terms of winners and losers, there's been some great drives in the early laps here, only eight laps into 102. But Steve Johnson has grabbed six position. He's up to ninth. Dahlgren four spots, Cam Waters five spots, and Russell Ingle seven positions. So they're the movers and shakers in the early stages. The other thing that's worth considering here, this first segment of the race will effectively, unless he makes a mistake, be owned by Scott McLaughlin. Regular runner, fast car, clear track. When you write that sum out, the equals off the back of it is he'll build a margin. The problem is that because he builds that margin, for those that are back in the mid-pack, they're going to be more likely to go a lap down when they do take their stop. And be, as you pointed out, because his co-driver's got pace as well, this is genuine game for them. Now, they want to get to lap 34. That's the minimum number of driver laps that the co-driver's got to achieve. 
So they'll be firmly looking at that data at the moment, managing tyres along the way, getting to lap number 34. We're on lap 9 of 102. Then they'll drop Alex Premer into the car. But the further he skips away, and that margin is already out to 2.6 seconds, and it's growing constantly, the worse the news is for those that are buried in the midfield and beyond. McLaughlin, Webb, Dumbrell, Canto, Delberto. Then it's Luff, Baird, Richards, Stephen Johnson, Dean Fiore. That's the top 10. Out of the race, if you've only just joined us, car number 22, Greg Murphy, unfortunately, tripping over car number 15, David Russell driving and sharing with Rick Kelly right at the start of the race. He bobbled getting off the line in the Nissan. We're now riding here with Tony Delberto, who was actually fastest in one of the sessions yesterday in practice. And he's... And he's uh, chasing car number 55 at the moment, which is being driven by Dean Cando. And there is Tim Slade on screen. I said earlier in the broadcast, that man on the right side of your television has had a pretty wretched year. He's got pace. He's proven it many times before. We've seen him on the podium. We see him in the front row of the grid in New Zealand, but, but he had a, a real dip in form and probably corresponding dip in confidence because of some of the things that have happened. There's been some unreliability and he puts his hand up too and there's been some mistakes. The car looks good out there at the moment. Tony's doing a really nice job in this thing. He's actually done a lot of racing here over the years. He's done more racing at this location than his teammate Tim Slade. So he's only five seconds from the lead of the motor race. Tony Delberto at the moment. And he looks pretty relaxed there in his pursuit of Dean Cando. Scotty McLaughlin's got that margin out to just on three seconds now. We'll take a quick break from the Gold Coast. Be back in a moment. on the Gold Coast. Scotty McLaughlin is the race leader at the moment with a margin that's almost four seconds now. Over Paul Dumbrell and Jonathan Webb and that little battle for second and third's heating up nicely at present. And then here we are with car number 17 because Stephen Johnson's been making good ground as well. I said earlier he was bitterly disappointed with what happened to him at Bathurst when they had a drama with the transaxle, the transmission in the car. It tipped him into the fence up at Sulman Park and uh, he's usually a pretty happy-go-lucky sort of a character, but that race means so much to he and his family. And uh, when he was leading the race to end up in the concrete there, it was very frustrating. But he was really quick yesterday in practice. He's sharing with David Wall. 
they're carrying different colours on this card this weekend. It's McGrath Foundation that they're supporting in that great cause. Scaping, you've got some data on how far he moved up off the grid. He's done a great job. He started 15th. He's gained six positions. He's running just at the back of the top 10 now. And so is this man, Ingle. Seven spots to get from position 25. So, guys, Oliver, Oliver Gavin, sorry, or Ollie, as we know him, uh, has made it back out of the pit lane. They've just put a new steering arm in. That's the one that has come out of the car. And you might be wondering, if that's his steering arm, how have they wheel aligned the car? Well, what they do, these little rod ends are adjustable. They wind in and out. And the team in their parts store will have a whole bunch of those already pre-measured to an exact length. They can just pop it in the car, wheel alignment's right, and off she goes. Yeah, good. Thanks, Marco. They're all prepared for those things, and all that stuff is critical because you can't afford to waste valuable time out there. You want to be classified, you need to get points. Meantime, this is a positional change on the Gillette replay. It actually shows Paul Dumbrell skating down the inside here and uh, grabbing a spot. This is on the run-up to turn 11. He's done it quite easily, back to second gear. He chirped it on the rear brake a little bit getting in there, but he was able to do it. Jonathan didn't make that big a fight out of it either, which is probably a smart call. A lot of mileage this year for Paul Dunrell with his Dunlop series drives and the success he's had, including the win at Sandown with Jamie Whitcup. They were right in the game until Forrest Selvo on the last lap at Bathurst as well. So plenty of useful mileage, and so he's at the peak of his powers at the moment. This is a pretty intense battle because Craig Baird is slowing Steve Richards down a little bit. He's just in front. We were on board just a second ago with Steve Johnson. So Steve Richards driving with Craig Lowndes. We're on board now with Steve. This is car 17. And this is 265 kilometers an hour as they approach turn one. Didn't catch the news earlier in the broadcast also. Wildcard entry for Sydney Olympic Park at the NRMA Sydney 500. Marcus Ambrose will be coming back from the US. He'll be driving a Penske Dick Johnson Racing Falcon. We presume with the number 17 on it see him in action out there which will be fantastic and then of course we'll see him next year so there's a lot of going on around this team at the moment this is the last outing this year for Stephen Johnson he wants to make a statement he's put a big effort into his physical fitness for the event he dropped a big pile of weight he's driving very nicely there at the moment so he's tucked in behind Stephen Richards who's been having a busy weekend as has the guy in the foreground Craig Baird because both Stephen and Craig are doing double duty this weekend they're driving V8 supercars in their co-driver's role, but they're also battling for a championship in the Porsche Carrera Cup. That's a whole other story and another pile of laps. Completely different motor car, different rhythm, different style, different tyres, different everything. It's sort of ironic that they end up out there and, and battling. So it's a nice little battle, this one. Baird is in seventh, then Richards, then Johnson, then Dean Fiore is the one tucked behind there in the Nissan. You can't quite see him at the moment. And there's some very strong combinations, not just in this group, but the group just in front. So Dumbrell in second. Dump down the inside. Good move. Steve Richards gets that done on Craig Baird without contact. We've seen a lot of overtaking there over the years. I'm just saying that Dumbrell, with all the driving that he's done, obviously the championship leaders, so a lot of pressure on them. But John O. Webb's done a really good job. Canto and Dave Reynolds, that's a strong combination. And you said before, Tony Dalberto has been very fast, he's driving with Slade. Luff is doing a good job with Garth Tander. He's currently in sixth. That shot that we had looking at the front of the cars, which you can see there now with two lights illuminated in behind the screen, a reminder that when you see the yellow and the green lights, it means the co-driver's in uh, and the soft tyre is on. So it's an all soft tyre weekend. So that'll help you determine when the co-drivers are in the car, which is the vast majority of the field at the moment. The only guy that... Uh, in the top 10 at least that doesn't have a co-driver in the only entry that doesn't at the moment is 33 scott mclaughlin so you won't see a green light there for him everybody else in this little gang's got it going just outside the 10 yulden owen douglas waters dahlgren alex davison then uh, alex buncombe who got a bit confused in that whole safety car deployment earlier together with russell ingle who's got up to 18th that you mentioned before then pie then andrew jones larko
Yeah, Neil, just to re-emphasise some of the positive points of McLaughlin's quirky strategy, and I think quite a smart one. I'll just come back to the whiteboard we did at the start of the session here. One little thing we hadn't thought of, which may well work for them. If we get a safety car, we're in here somewhere at the moment. Remember, our co-driver's got to do 34 laps. If they get one, say, between 24 and 34, Scotty will actually be able to come in and actually put Alex Premer in the car. He can go and do his 34 laps, and Scotty can get in at the end. Everyone else is going to have to leave their co-driver in to lap 34. Now, of course, if you can change your co-driver under safety car, that is much right, smarter than being able to save enough to change him under green conditions. So if they get one in here, they will absolutely be in the box seat. And I think the other real advantage, thanks for that, Larko, is just being able to dodge the bullets at the start, you know, reducing that risk, having one of the guys in the car that's doing it every second week of his life. has a really big impact around here where the risk and reward at a race track like this is very different to many of the other tracks that we visit. It's a great shot at the it's overhead right. down yeah. there between one, two and three and how tight that is and how hungry they get trying to make pace. There's Cam Waters putting a move down the inside of Taz Douglas. So that moves him up uh, to 13th. Another break. We'll be back on the Gold Coast in just a moment. Scotty McLaughlin's got 5.1 seconds. Welcome back. What a stunning landscape for our 3K racetrack. We're 20 laps down of 102. Scott McLaughlin leads by 5.6 seconds over Dumbrell, Webb, Canto, Dalberto, Luff. Stevie Richards is in with Craig Lowndes. They're currently seventh. Steve Johnson, Baird and Yulden. That's your top ten. And it's worth just thinking, Mark, I reckon, about just what all this means when primary drivers get back in and where this all plays for the championship so you've got car number one in second at the moment with a 297 point lead what they cannot afford at all this weekend is anything crazy risky anything yep. that basically takes them out of the game and steals a bunch of points from them will mean that the angry pack are going to swallow them 
in the remaining rounds because including this one there are three to the end of the championship 900 points available 297 is the gap at the moment and of course there's a, a lot of focus on Winterbottom in car number five and also on Lowndes in car number triple eight so you look at where those guys are at the moment you've got Richards in Craig Lowndes car in seventh and uh, you've got Steve Owen in car number five back in uh, 12th position. So just thought I'd update everybody as to where their favourites may be. Uh, and not only that, the, the biggest issue is if you do have a crash here with 300 points over the weekend, the likelihood is if you crash today, you're out for tomorrow. You know, it's just such an unforgiving place. So we're on board with Dean Canto. We're going to stay on board at this very unforgiving and pretty wild racetrack. Stay with us. Turn 12, just listen for the wheel spin. This is where you'll hear it here, the final corner. So he very quickly into second gear. In fact, I'm surprised that he's using first gear at this point of the race. Probably better off to leave it in second and limit the wheel spin. I was really interested to listen to the car down at turn four at the hairpin because there was quite evidence down there of wheel spin. This is one, two, three, really high speed. They take it in third gear. This is one, let's listen. I think it was just an anomaly last time. So when we heard him down there on the previous lap, I think he gave it a bit of a buzz, but he knows, they all know at the moment, they've got to be very careful with that. In the back end of the stint, all tires drama here for car number nine. Alex Davison's got damage. So that was... Box this lap means they want him in the pits. That's uh, Alex Davis at car number nine. Erebus Motorsport entry. Biko backing. And he said, he talked about the rack. When he says that, he means steering rack. So it's got some other damage though. So I don't know what came first, whether there was damage. And here's a response. Car number 33, Scott McLaughlin is in. Lap 24. Alex Premer, the Frenchman, about to jump on board. He's got a seat insert. They've simplified the seat insert in car 55 this weekend as well. Instead of two, they've got one for Dean Cando and David Reynolds. Alex is in quick and clean. Nice job. It's only fuel now. That was a really good, efficient stop, particularly from Alex. He just got in calmly, buckled himself up, plugged everything in, and launches. And like most things, when you watch really good people executing things like that, it's all slow and very calm. And what you said, Prompo, about the way that Alex got in was like that, but so was the rest of the stop. Guys doing the tyres, guys doing the fuel, it was all very low heart rate stuff. And that's the damage that you said. It's actually almost got the bottom of the air down there torn off it. And it was on the angle when we saw it last, so it's lower on the other side. So actually, I think there's probably more damage over on the other side. I'm surprised they didn't see that on our, our images and have one out there on standby because they're not going to be able to get away with that. Here we go. This is so our a big, big lockup. Straight through at turns one, two and three. But maybe he's had a little rug with someone earlier in the race. There's a lot of scuffing there. All those witness marks on the front left-hand corner of the car means he's either made contact with the tyre bundles or he's had a rub with another car. Alex Davison. Those big silver levers are the front and rear anti-roll bar controls, then the gear lever, and that's an agitated Alex Davison in the background. So actually going to roll it into the garage now. Uh, they can 
put more people on the job more, uh, in, a, in a safer environment in there than they can in the pit lane. I believe that we've got an eavesdropper on the line at the moment as well, Scapey. I think James Courtney's down there with his ears on. Hello, JC. Am so, boys. Am so. I'm all over you too. Yeah, I was about to slag you. Right? Now I know you're there, I'll go a little bit carefully. Don't be shy, just fire it in. Uh, no, listen, it's not a funny business when you're unfortunately standing there chatting to your teammate, uh, Greg Murphy. Tell him to be quiet. <laughs> they can hear you, Murph. Yeah. They're saying you're not funny. <laughs> So, he's, he's right, we shouldn't be laughing. No, you shouldn't be I'm laughing. Not. Great frustration in all seriousness. You're fourth in the championship and you need points at the moment. And any uh, further understanding of what exactly what unfolded out there? Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit hairy here, these lads. But uh, now Murph got a good start. Dave Russ in front, stalled. Uh, and then as Murph's going past him, he's pulled in. This is exciting here. You, you can call it, James. Uh, yeah, that looked pretty wild, didn't it? So that was Dean Fiore arriving at Mac 4. And I think he cut the line on the way in there too. So He's called Fonzie this weekend if you want to get up with it. <laughs> he looks like he was smoking as well there. Like the so stop here for car number 36, and that was a near miss for them. We'll come back to you, James. There's a bit going on there at the moment. So this is the Michael Caruso Dean Fiore entry. That was very, very close to a nose-to-tail contact on the run into pit lane there with all that other congestion. Turn it off, please, and then we go back. Obviously, flight change plans. It looks like... Luckily, they got that tyre set off, because one of those front tyres, if not both of them, would have been tortured, no doubt. Problem here also for Cam Waters. One of the boys there, actually, I think almost got run over by the Gojack. And, um, maybe you've manoeuvred one of these cars and had one of those things grab your toes, you know all about it. So that's very frustrating for them. Again, terrific speed. Mount Panorama several weeks ago. Some new colours this weekend. Uh, I know what's going on here. It's because Fiore's actually been trying to get back to the left to get in the pits oh. and couldn't get himself in there because so much going on. And then because he had to match the racing speed on the track, he was too quick when he got to the lane. Now I understand more of what's going on here. So, and it was because car seven, Alex Bunkham, had to go round to the left and then in the end, Dean did get into the pit lane entry had a 100 metre lock up and went as close as he dared at getting into the back of Cam Waters at the pit lane entry. If you end up being mispositioned by traffic, to do the diagonal and get to the left side of the road to get the pit lane entry here is quite hard. 17 in, Stephen Johnson. And your peripheral vision is really inhibited by the Hans device, the seat wings or the, the top of the seat structure and effectively how far back you sit and the B pillar of the car. When you try to actually look left, you can only see uh, only a very marginal um, left. From the back of the car, you've got no idea. And what he did actually in the end was a very good move to get himself across to the left-hand side. Those onboard shots that we had and the focus we have now is with Steve Owen, championship contender in car five, sharing with Mark Winterbottom. He's currently ninth. Got Robert Dahlgren behind him in the Volvo. Meantime, Robert's teammate Alex Premer, who's jumped into car 33, sharing with Scott McLaughlin, the early leader of the race. He's actually just done the fastest lap of the race, done a 1 minute 12.1. Pretty speedy in race conditions, given that we uh, we saw high 10s and 11s in qualifying. Remember, they got fresh tyres, but they do have a load of fuel on with that car, so it's near enough to 90 kilos of fuel, which is pretty impressive, which was Mark Larkham's point before about... Alex Premer speed and that's indicated immediately by that lap timer a 12.18. Very smart lap time for this time of the race, as you see it, with a lot of fuel on board. This is good to see for Robert Dahlgren as well, Mark, because oh trouble here for car 21 and 8 again. They are teammates. Now we saw them get together oh. at Bathurst. Now I think you'll find it's Andrew Jones in eight at the moment, it is, and uh, Chris Pitha, the Kiwi, is in car 21. So what's going on here? Oh, Brad Jones, heart rate right now is going to be a bit unnecessary, but off the anyway, clock. Keep trucking on here. So Andrew Jones in the Team BOC entry, he shares with Jason Bright. And uh, Chris Pith of the Kiwi is sharing with Dale Wood, and they've made contact down there at Turn 4. So Aaron Noonan's just found out regarding the... Dean Fiore car, they had a tyre delaminating, that's why he needed to get to the pit and as you can see when he finally ended up locking the brakes, that was the end of that tyre anyway 
Brad Jones, once again, I'm speaking to you on the worst possible situation when you're the team boss and your two cars have collected each other. How do you deal with these situations? Well, it's just one of those things, isn't it? They're both racing for a position. It's unfortunate. You have a long way to go in the race. Anyway, we'll have a talk about it afterwards and see if we can't sort it out. Thanks, Brad. No worries. Just, um, just waiting for these two guys that, right, they're having a little bit of engineering chat about soft and hard anti roll bars. Hey, Scotty, good first stint, mate. Interesting strategy. One of the things we said as an advantage is, apart from your ability to get the gap, is it's good to be able to throw Alex in the car, isn't it, eh? Yeah, and it, the best thing about Alex, he's been fast and he's been sort of similar to my pace. So we, we're, we're flexible in some ways in the strategy. So I just had to get a good start, which I semi did, um, and uh, it was all right. One thing we're interested to know from the driving perspective, this tyre pressure thing, for people at home, I mean, you've got to run a minimum of 17. As they get hot, they go up, they get harder. From your perspective, driving the car, manageable, dramatic, drama? Uh, no, I don't think it's drama, but it's manageable, I think. I think uh, at the end of the day, um, it's the same for everyone, and um, we, our car feels OK on them, but they are t towards the end of the stint, because it's so hot, it's, it's actually losing the rear quite quickly um, and you've got to manage that at the start of your stint which I was doing so different gears here and there different lines helps a lot and uh, I, I think I, I, I was able to learn just then where all these other guys haven't. Look forward to seeing you at the back end of the race mate. Yeah I'll see how we go on a surfboard I'll go surfing I will I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty McLaughlin great guy <laughs> he led the race early in car surfing. number 33 he's only 21 years of age and he's in good shape because of flexibility because both those guys have got pace. It opens up more options to that team as to how they play the game strategically. Right now, our race leader, though, is Paul Dumbrell. That's the way to watch your V8 supercars from up above, looking down at all the amazing action around this racetrack. Welcome back to the Gold Coast and our coverage of the Castrol Edge. Gold Coast 600, race 31 of 38 of the championship. Situation at the moment, it's a 4.7 second lead. Paul Dunbrell in the Red Bull Holden over Jonathan Webb in the VIP Pet Foods Holden Commodore. The early leader has changed and uh, Alex Premer, the Frenchman, has taken over from Scotty McLaughlin, but those guys are still going nicely at the moment in 15th and making very, very good pace. Plenty of battles going on up and down. Before we get into any of that stuff, we'll go downstairs. Here's Rihanna. Cam Waters, the positive thing from Bathurst is that the pace has continued here to the Gold Coast. The bad thing is the bad luck, unfortunately, has also continued. You're out of the race, the car's in the garage. What's happened? Yeah, we had an awesome pace. Started 21st, and I think I made my way up to 12th or something. The car was awesome. I was just kind of looking after the tyres at the end there, and then um, I think we split a radiator, so yeah, it's nice and hot around here, so you've got to have one of them. And uh, we look forward to seeing you out here tomorrow. Thank you. Cam Waters from uh, Mildura. 
he's sharing with Jack Perkins. And uh, the gel went forward, unfortunately, sideline. We saw it go back into the pit garage there a couple of laps earlier. So under pressure at the moment in car five is Steve Owen. That's Scotty Pye sneaking up the inside at turn 11 on him. And it uh, looks like Steve's just got a little battle on his hands at the moment, trying to maintain the pace. The start range, because they lose a couple of laps due to the formation and reconnaissance laps from their full fuel load, we expect to be averaging around about 39 laps. Now, uh, we'll be watching and see how everybody runs here in terms of how they deal with these stints and how far they push the tyres. So all the radio chatters, three to four laps to go before they get into that window. And remember, the minimum is 34 laps that the co-driver must do. So they're all now in that window. Just got to organise themselves now to get this next change made nicely. Cool suits, all the things that happen in terms of that changeover. Yeah, other thing that's uh, just a little bit tricky that we've got to circumnavigate in our world here at the moment with our computer timing is that because everybody's been through the pit lane, it looks like they've already stopped, but in fact, that was just a trundle through the pit lane. So the guy in the field that's actually done a genuine stop, the only one that's done a stop for strategic and competitive reasons rather than a problem, is car number 33, Alex Trevor. He's currently in 15th and Red Bull are laying up, as you can see there at the moment, likely uh, preparing for car number one. So on board with Dalberto, you see the amount of sliding that Canto had going. We were talking about the wheel spin before, we are on board with that and the Bottle of Falcon, in comes Dumbrell. Here's all the chat. So this is dispensing with the driver minimums for the co-drivers. That's the aim of the game here. And then a double stint for the key driver for the vast majority. Volvo have played this differently. Championship leader. Jamie Whitcup gets in. Very nice. Just have a look at the United fuel flow there. The E85, just over 70 litres. Almost 89 litres goes in. And now this man will be back where he should be in terms of their speed. And this is the rejoin. So Whitcup comes out. He'll be a couple of hundred metres behind. Alex Prema, by the time he warms those tyres up, remember it's a soft tyre this weekend, so not too bad in the methodology of getting that tyre back up to speed. These guys, oh, now in position, that was very close for Dave Reynolds. And Andrew Jones was so committed then that there was no backing out of that one, so that was that was a near miss, that was close. David Reynolds in car 55, Andrew Jones still in eight. Mark's point there about tyres. With the Dunlop soft tyre, they come up to temperature quicker. Different compounding than the regular tyre. This is Shane Van Gisbergen in. Jonathan Webb, good first stint. Was a good first stint. No mistakes. Nice solid job. Hands the car back in good order. Oh, Jimmy, would have been in a, a small panic with all that restart action going on around him. And overshooting the starting grid. He had to put it in reverse. Yeah, try and sort reverse out before you start the race is never a good vibe. So, Shane Van Gisbergen in. Car number two you can see there as well. It's the Garth Tander Warren Love Holden Racing Team entry. Single Holden Racing Team entry now with the other car sideline. Sadly, we had a quick chat to James before it got busy. So they, they all fell together nicely like a zip down there then. But often when they roll out of the pit lane, it is anything but tidy. Paul Morris hasn't stopped. He couldn't take that stop then with the rest of them because he would have got a lap down. So he's actually battling for position, but he hasn't stopped. So this is really hurting Chas Mostert. So first car again, just emphasising in the queue that has done the stop is Alex Premer. He's fifth as they all unwind through this process now. Pi is actually the race leader in car number 16, Wilson Security Falcon. Craig Baird stepping away from car number four. And wasn't watching the oncoming traffic then, Baird, though. It's very... This, this place physically one of the hardest places in the country not only just the temperature but the 
level of commitment and he's so close to crashing lap after lap after lap very physically demanding and to see Baird get out there a lot of guys it'll be very taxing and the start of the race is always more stressful Moffat's been in the fence a lot of damage to the right hand front of car 360 not sure where that, that would have been so this is just after the stop for these guys, right? So they stopped just a couple of laps ago, so early in the game, either rounding up traffic or just a plain simple mistake. Uh, James has made a mistake. So Gilmore is stepping out now. They did clear that opportunity. Mostert now stepping in. Okay, this, will, this will put him a lap down. So Scott Pye, Robert Dahlgren are still first and second. They haven't taken their stop yet. There's the effective leader, Alex Kramer. So and hard uh, to get your lap back when this happens, isn't it? Because, you, I mean, other than the drama of a safety car, you don't get the advantage. That's so. right. <laughs> but I, the probability here when you look down through the record over the years is that we will see one. The problem with the safety car is that when they arrive is the hard part to predict. It's not, right. not if it'll arrive. <laughs> So there's a problem also, uh, car number seven out there at present. Todd Kelly is complaining on the radio and they're making it his call as to whether he wants to bring it in and have it looked at, whatever the issue may be. Todd's currently 18th at the moment in the Jack Daniels Nissan. I've got to give Robert Dahlgren, he's, he's driven very well. He's currently second on the road. He hasn't stopped, obviously, at this point, but he's probably his best drive that I've seen him put on and this is a very difficult racetrack, easy to make a mistake, so congratulations to him on a very sound So that's the me mechanical black flag you can hear in the background there from race director Tim Schenken for loose body work on the James Moffat entry James still circulating at the moment uh, in 17th position but they want that brought in now and for the damage to be de dealt with This is a Key battle here for position. We're watching Alex Premer in the Volvo, and he's under assault at the moment from Jamie Wincup. And Wincup's on the younger tyres. These guys are on a different st a strategic sequence. And so um, Wincup here is sizing him up for a move. Now, the risk here is that with less grip available, Alex doesn't need to respond and take himself out of phase or rhythm. So if he, if he thinks he's vulnerable, it's early days. Probably just going to have to let him go to try and get his elbows too high and wide. Yeah, I agree. So what Neil's saying is if he tries to block, then you potentially put yourself into a vulnerable position and you can just see the, the younger tyre there and the drive traction coming out of the final corner. Much better there for Wink Up. And when we saw them rejoin, it was about a 200 metre gap. So Wink Up's done a good job in terms of outright pace to get to the back of Prema. Well, he's had to run through. So, that is a that is a drum. That's exactly right. You, <laughs> you're better off just to let him by. You're better off to let him... What Neil was saying before is just put the white flag up and let him go. Yeah, well, two of the best co-drivers down here in the business are watching this very closely. First is Stevie Richards. Mate, you are soaking wet. That is a tough gig out there, eh? Yeah, it's not nice and hot up here. It helps having the uh, having the old cool, cool suits working well, but... Um... Yeah, just the, obviously the soft the soft tyres, they go away a little bit, so you're managing that, you're managing trying to catch the guys in front and keep the guys behind, but uh, it's good fun. Nice first stint, mate. Now, I'm just going to keep my eye on the monitor up there, mate, like you are, I can see. Paul Dunbrell, that's your man, he's attacking. There you go, look at that, he's right in there. Um, Paul, got to ask you about the restart. I mean, we thought you may have been cued or you thought they had a drama. What, what went on? You were certainly away with it, but realised you had to back off. 
Yeah, no, uh, just... just uh, don't take your right that yeah, one. Yeah, no, one eye on there, one eye on the camera. No, uh, with the safety car coming out quite late, so getting called off quite late, there was a fair bit of commotion there, so uh, everyone went, everyone went, and so did I. So, uh, anyway, it looks like uh, um, it's been okay so far, so we'll just soldier on and deal with that afterwards. All right, mate, well done. Thank you very much. This is really building up here to a peak moment because Wind Cup's impatient, and as we talked about a few moments ago, Prem is trying to raise the work rate at the moment to fend off the challenge and that's putting him into a position of vulnerability we saw him make a mistake at the chicane on the previous lap he's doing everything he can at the moment there's 11 laps difference in the tire age in favor of the red bull holden in the middle of this pie at the moment then mixed into the game is Chaz mostard so this is a bathurst carbon copy with mostard and wind cup and they've got to be so careful here there's not contact and wind cup gets up the inside puts a move on nice and clean and takes a bit of the pressure off with Prema and indeed so does car number six so mossed it through as well and in a couple of corners the game has changed and, and he almost had to do it wink up had to do it because Mostert's trying to get his lap back so he was desperate to get by both those guys to be back on the lead lap so he was going to fire down the inside at turn 11. Wink up went across to cover him he thought well I better get down the inside here or Mostert's going to grab both of us so that was a pretty wild moment. We're on board now with Jamie. This is a great move. And there's manhole covers and seams in the road up here. And he just jams it down the inside, uses a bit of engine braking. He had space on the exit, but it was... He interrupted the flow of Alex enough for Chaz to be able to have a crack here at turn 12. And he only just squeaked through. Here it is from above. Gillette replay shows us exactly what's happened here. And it was a good decisive manoeuvre there from Wind Cup. Alex left a little gap. And then Chaz just watched this for a surgical manoeuvre down the inside. Whack. And there wasn't too much space there. Alex tried to turn in, but there was a Falcon underneath him. And as Mark quite rightly pointed out, this is about trying to get the lap back for the guy in car number six. Jason Bright preparing to take over here from Andrew Jones. They're down the order at the moment. After that contact down at turn four. It's all going on at the top end of town. Back in a moment. I confirm you have a radio. Thank you. Focused here on Alex Premer in car number 33. He's currently second, but coming under extreme pressure from car number 97, Shane Van Gisberg. And while we're away in the break, there's been a shift of positions here. So it's all going on. And the interesting thing here 
is just how everybody's going to look after their tyres in this particular hot stint of the race. So we're watching from the rear bumper of Kremer. He's looking at car number 97, Shane Van Gisbergen, and fourth position, and right behind them is Tim Slade in car number 47. He's fourth. The reason I said there's been movement in the break was that uh, car six, Chaz Mostert, has been showing great speed. His tyre's a couple of laps younger than Jamie Wincup, so he's been able to get his lap back. Meantime, look at this, up the inside now. Again, with younger tyres and car number 97, Shane Van Gisbergen. But it's not done yet. It's a full-blown drag race. There's nothing wrong with the pace of the Volvo, as we know. And who blinks? It was actually Alex, because he just doesn't have the tyre grip at the moment to be able to continue that argument. You don't want to be up there side by side into that chicane. Just doesn't work. Now, Slade's going to go down the inside here as well, and he does. Now, that's for third. So Alex has put up a decent fight. He's done the right thing, though. He hasn't actually taken it right to the nth degree because there's a huge risk in that and he just doesn't have the tyre grip. Here's what I spoke about a little bit for, uh, earlier and uh, great pace on the Gillette replay there for Chas Mostert to be able to force the issue down the inside of Jamie Wincup at turn four. So now he does have his lap back. What they'll be praying for at Pepsi Max Ford Performance Racing is for the Peter's safety car to jump onto the racetrack and when the field compresses then he'll be able to potentially get back in the game. The only risk for Chaz, he's had to use the tyres very aggressively to catch and pass Jamie. Exactly. And he's got to use them hard in this early part of the stint. You've got to be careful that he doesn't take too much out of the bank for later in the stint. Here's Rihanna. Yeah, unfortunately, another, another disappointing day for Erebus Motorsport. Alex Davison back out on track, but then was forced to come back into pit lane. The bonnet was not able to be pinned down, so they've had to tape his bonnet down. We saw here the team punching the bonnet down, trying to bang it down, but uh, he's now put down plenty of laps, and uh, unfortunately, his day is done. Todd Kelly, he is also in the garage. They have a power steering failure, so another disappointing day for Nissan Motorsport as well. Thanks, Rihanna. In fact, we, we thought it had a oil pressure issue with uh, Todd's car, so interesting to see what has actually stopped car seven. So at the moment, we cut leads from Van Gisbergen, Slade, Prema, who's falling back. He's got older tyres on that car. He's got to get to lap 57 before he can change over with McLaughlin. They're on an alternate strategy versus the rest. Tander, Lowndes, Reynolds, Johnson, Fiori, Coulthard. That is your top 10. Mark Winterbottom, who's second in the championship, is currently 11th. There was some uh, wheel spinning there, unfortunately, for car number 21 as well. So that's Chris Pipper and Dale Wood. That's the scene on the Gold Coast. Wind Cup's got a margin of four seconds. There are a couple of guys doing a nice job in the back end of the 10 as well. We'll focus on them when we come back.
It's all sunshine and smiles here on the Gold Coast for the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600. If you're one of the tens of thousands of fans around the precinct at the moment, seen some pretty lively activity so far. It's resolved with a three and a half second margin for Jamie Wincup over Shane Van Gisbergen as they continue what's been a season long battle for those guys. And here's the highlights thus far. And it got lively right at the very beginning for Greg Murphy, who pulled out to try and pass a stumbling David Russell in car 15, Jack Daniels Racing. He bobbled, bogged down or stalled the Nissan. And then when he did relaunch it, he also just moved slightly to the left. And between the two of them, they managed to find each other, David Russell and Greg Murphy. So Greg out, car number 22, his 200th event start in V8 Supercars. Then there was a very messy restart where Paul Dumbrell bolted. We don't really know exactly why all that happened at the moment, but he did. He shot down the road, and then that had to be redressed, which it ultimately was. 33's been quick all day and continues to be so, so the boys at uh, Red Bull Racing quickly on the job there, making sure that Paul Dumbrell knew that he had to sort that out. He's had good pace as well. And this is indicative of the kind of action that we see on the Gold Coast through these curbs. Unbelievable stuff. High speed S is down there at one, two and three. It hasn't caused as much trouble as we thought it might have so far this weekend. On a different strategy, the Volvo boys, Premer and McLaughlin. McLaughlin started the race and then for Brad Jones Racing, I mean, Bradley, I know what he's thinking. He just can't say it. Andrew Jones. Chris Pither got together at turn four. Then the majority of the field ran to a normal strategy where they had their co-driver in at the start. They got to their driver minimums and then changed drivers. Now this wheel spinning there for car number 21. Oh no, there's been another drama for car number 55. David Reynolds at the helm. It's torn the front right corner out of the car. Second successive race meeting that these guys have got pain. That's the team owner, Rob Nash, in the foreground. Have a look at it, see if you can put some arms on it. And that's straight into the garage and out of business for them. It's had a big hit. Huge damage there to the right front. Pick up this. Oh, and he's gone straight in. That's just a concrete wall there straight ahead. Big one at turn 12. That's at the northern end. So just uh, understeered white. Second safety car of the day. And there's the reason why it's the under tray from David Reynolds' car. And all that debris, massive amounts of it. Turn 12 on the exit. You can imagine what it's like offline when you get on that stuff. There is absolutely no grip. That's effectively a wing, although it doesn't look like it. It's part of the underbody of the front under tray of the car, part of the front bumper assembly. It's got a camber on it, so it's like an aerofoil, like an aircraft wing. Makes downforce when they're off the car. The car handling is awful. And it's an awful day for David Reynolds. It's a little bit funny in that. I had a bit under the next corner. The voice of David Reynolds in the background. So there may be a little bit more to the story too. He could have, sometimes you can catch the inside wall there at turn 12, but it sounds like he's describing some issues from a corner or two back. Something felt funny. No doubt we'll talk to him a little bit later on. It's very disappointing to see, especially when those guys had a difficult Bathurst as well, when they were in contention. So some people using this second Petter's safety car intervention for a stop. Wind Cup has not reacted, nor has Van Gisbergen. Remember that for car number 33, out of sequence, they were going to take their fuel range potentially out as far as about lap 62 or 63. You can see we're still 10 odd laps away from that at the moment. Whenever this stuff happens, it, this is where you've got to get the calculator out and think deeply. And he won't, he, at this point, have met the minimum requirement for his laps. So he'll have to run further into the race as a consequence of taking the safety car. I, it looked like, Neil, I, I don't know whether we're right on it, but oh, here we go. This might be a bit of an explanation. I thought he hit the inside wall. A lot of damage there. That, that's basically what's caused here. Yeah. That, so that may have dragged under the right-hand front wheel. The source of the drama will no doubt be that very heavy contact with the tyre bundles there. 
and uh, things have deteriorated. And then Dave said it had understeer. Well, it would because the whole front wing's broken on the car. Very unfortunate for him in the Botolo Ford Falcon. While the safety car's out, a chance to take a break. There's the reason why in the background Chrysler Petter's safety car is out. And as a result of that, we'll take a break. That way we don't lose too much racing. We're back in just a moment. seen on the Gold Coast and it's the Chrysler Petters safety car that's got control of the field at the moment. It's out for the second time today. What's interesting is uh, Wind Cup has not reacted. They've left him out there, Mark, but many of those that he's racing have. So Tander and Luff, they've taken a stop, which means fresh tyres. Uh, other key runners include, uh, let me see, Van Gisbergen and Webb, and also Lowndes and Richards. So watch those three cars. They will be pretty speedy. The other great advantage here is for car number six. Remember I said that if they get a safety car, the train compresses the field. That gives Chas Most a chance to get back in the game. Well, he's 10th on the lead lap with a fast car, well and truly in this. Dave Reynolds win this Gold Coast Circuit bites. It bites really hard. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's probably not the best thing, but, you know, uh, our car probably wasn't the best out there and I was trying to make it up through the chicane and maybe took a bit too much curb and, um, yeah, the next, or two left-handers later, the front right broke and then, um, yeah, it was, hit the wall pretty hard. Pretty disappointed for all my Bodlow boys, like, you know, we worked pretty hard this week and we had good pace and, um, you know, we'll come back, fight again tomorrow. You've won this track before. We know you're fast around here. We know Dino loves this circuit. We look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. Yeah, thanks. Similar story as last year. You know, the, our Saturday was pretty ordinary and our Sunday was brilliant. So hopefully you can do the same. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. A, a guy I get to talk to a lot now, mate, and I only get to talk to you because your team does such a great job. Pole again this weekend. Uh, fresh tyres on your man. The guys in front of him, not necessarily so. You're in pretty good shape today. Yeah, I think we're looking all right. You know, obviously uh, a bit of mixed strategy there. Some guys stop. Some guys didn't, but I think we're feeling all right. Yeah, we've got a uh, got plenty of fuel, fresher tyres. Obviously, there's a couple of back markers in the way, but I think we should be able to get through them pretty right. And I noticed Shane's the only guy out there that's done a sub-12 second lap, so well done, mate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 1 minute 11.9 for Shane Van Gisbergen, the fastest lap of the race, and he's the best place guy with fresh tyres in position five. Back in a moment. Understood, mate, understood. Let's just uh, continue to monitor that for me. If it gets any worse, I'll have to come back in and just keep chipping away. Going. Go, 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 go. Pull it, 
Looks pretty good in the front there, James. It's the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600 and Mega Wall's got it covered for you on seven. Around the circuit in the pit lane in those wild curbs. From above, around, beyond, underneath, in, out, everything. Cam's race control. There's plenty going on out there. We hope you're enjoying the coverage this afternoon. The leader is Jamie Wincup. He didn't stop. Nor did Mark Winterbottom, nor did Ash Walsh, nor Greg Ritter. However, Shane Van Gisbergen, who's fifth. Tim Slade, sixth. Craig Lounge, seventh. Garth Tander, eighth. They did stop. Oh, little mistake there. Little mistake there for 17. That's David Wall. He's second on the road, but actually not second on the computer timing. He's down in 13th at the moment. So this is going to be a little bit like our Bathurst tale only a couple of weeks ago. A tale of different strategies of those who've got grip and those who don't. And as that safety car progressed there, we were starting to wonder about those who've come in and put a squirt of fuel in, including, by the way, Mostert. Remember, I went to the break and talked about Mostert... Um, came in while we were in the break and actually stopped for fuel and they only did and here it is for the, the uh, Gillette replay I'll show the story here they just did the right rear tyre this is the working tyre on the car the one that works hardest around here so they've cleaned that up they, and the reason I picked it up was I heard I wasn't focused on the images at the time I heard them say on the radio one cold tyre but by filling it up with fuel I'm now wondering whether or not they can get that car home I'll crunch numbers but they'll they'll need some safety car no doubt but yeah. oh, you'd be a brave man to bet against it. Look at this, Scapey. This is on two. This is for position. They're fighting for four. And it's going to fall in favour of Van Gisbergen down the inside here. Oh, gee, he arrived right sideways back there. <laughs> he got away with it. Good move down the inside. So as Neil said, a lot of strategy unfolding here as Slade fires down the inside at turn four. A little bit of contact. This is it. Pretty wild moment because Lowndes and Tander are hooked in behind and a lot of guys have actually gone a lap down. So from position 12, that they that currently mossed it, everyone behind from 13 back is a lap down after that recent stop. Look at Slade. Done. Nice job. Car number 47, Tim Slade. He's currently sixth. Rounding up car eight that's down the order. Jason Bright's in that car at the moment, and Brighty's one of those that's been lapped, as you said. So he's trying to race, but at the same time not get too mixed up in the front runner's performances. Oh, this oh. is tight. And through and down the inside is Garth Panner in car two, but only just. So going back to that question before, what Ford Performance Racing have elected to do with car six by putting that tyre on it, and by sticking some fuel in it, if by quirk of circumstance, and we're a fairly long way shy of the mark here, I might mention, but if you've got enough safety car laps, you might do it. Yeah. But you'd need probably another one or two interventions. But, you know, who knows? But right now, 
the two guys that are in contention for the series. So the leaders of the championship, Jamie Winkup, Mark Winterbottom, are currently first and second. They're 297 points apart, but they've got to go because they didn't take the last stop. They've got to get a gap. They've got to bolt. They've got to do qualifying laps to get themselves back in contention with this because Van Gisbergen is on the freshest tyres with this change. So they didn't choose to pit. And now, strategically, we've really got to get our brain around what sort of gap Wing Cup and Winterbottom can eke out before they have to stop again. And there's this diminishing returns on tyres that are ageing now because for Wing Cup, the last stop was 34, and for Winterbottom, the last stop was 35. Shane Van Gisbergen, who's blazing, as you can see in that yellow and black Commodore, there he is right in the centre of your screen. He's third at the moment. He's got the fastest lap of the race against his name. And he only just stopped a moment ago on lap number 51. So he's got some uh, grip to play with. And he's using it well at the moment down the inside here of car number four. Remember, these guys are a lap down. So the reason that Shane is firing down the inside with such vigour is that those guys would be told to Lee Holdsworth would have been on the radio to his team. And they've, they would have said that Van Gisbergen is on the fly and he fired down there into turn four. Very nice maneuver, no contact. Lee also gave him room. Just going to talk to uh, Tim Edwards, the team principal down here at Ford Performance Racing. Now, I want to ask you about Chas Mostert, but I just saw you type a complaint in, if you like, about car triple two holding one of your cars up. Yeah, I mean, Gavin's excessively blocking. Not only does he deserve blue flags, but he's, you know, he's all over the place trying to stop Chas. So he's trying to encourage him to give him a blue flag. And they should, because he's a lap down or several laps down. You're dead right, mate. Um, Chas came in, a uh, single rear tyre, but topped him up with fuel. Now, we know about 41 laps on a tank of fuel. You're not there yet, but the strategy here is pray for a safety car and maybe get him home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got him back into a good place just outside the top ten. He's got fuel in hand on a few of the cars in front of him, including his teammate. But that right rear tyre is what Klopp's a, a real hiding ground here. So, you know, if we want to stretch the next fuel window, you know, we needed the freshest possible right rear tyre. Interesting to watch, eh? Thanks, mate. It's like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that's what they'll be banking on, so they'll need either a, a solid safety car intervention or a couple of them. And if that's the case, then that could very much change things. But they're all if, buts and maybes, so they're just trying to give themselves some flexibility at the moment. Look at Van Gisbergen, who's charging. Meantime, Jamie Winkup on an older tyre, I might mention, has just moved the fastest lap of the race to a 1 minute 11.96. I saw his sectors coming up whilst we were with the interview with Tim Edwards. And so he's responded, as Mark said before, he's got a blaze, and he's doing that. And that was a nice bit of driving then from David Wall. We were on board car 17 as Van Gisbergen arrived at the fast chicane. He just come out of the throttle really gently, and he allowed Van Gisbergen in. We know he's a lap down, and that was a nice bit of driving. New fastest lap again for Jamie Wincup. He's in qualifying mode. He's just done a 1 minute 11.87. He took a tenth from his own best lap. He's got the gap out to 6.7 seconds now over Frosty, whose uh, last lap was a 12.8, so he made a second on Mark Winterbottom in one lap. Pretty impressive. So that pace we just spoke of, Wink Cup and Winterbottom, first and second in the championship, trying to make ground. But that man in the foreground, the VIP Pet Foods, Holden Commodore, is coming through. He's on the freshest tyres. He's got car pace. Using every little bit of road you can see there. So easy to give the fence a bump. That's where Dave Reynolds crashed a few laps ago. This is pace that Jamie's displaying at the moment. It is giving him the best opportunity to maximise the strategy that they're on really early in the game to start thinking about what it means at the end of that string of numbers on the bottom left of your screen at lap 102. But uh, on the current numbers that Jamie's churning out, that, that's going to get him somewhere on or very close to the podium. But unless Mark Winterbottom can find something in his lap speed performance, the opposite's applying to him because he's, as you can see on screen at the moment, drifting into the clutches of Shane Van Gisbergen. Ding, ding. <laughs> Great, isn't it? It's the only racetrack in the world with a light rail so close in terms of proximity to the circuit. And now this is a critical stop for McLaughlin. 
Premier out, McLaughlin in. This is right on that critical lap number that Mark Larkham explained to us at the start. That was a little bit slow then. It took him a long time to sort the belt. In fact, I reckon he held the stop up because of it. So, to find the knuckle then, he was sitting on it. He had to return it to the unlock position. Sorry, the lock position. So that the belts would go in and accept and latch. Meantime, top end of the circuit, Van Gisbergen is going to get a move done here. Rear bumper of the Falcon, front bumper of the Holden. Van Gisbergen with younger tyres. He stuck them on on lap 51. Last stop for Mark Winterbottom and the Steve Owen car. That was lap 35, so big difference in tyre age. And what's happening is the, the speed... Oh, here he is down the inside now. Actually, good, smart manoeuvre, I reckon, by Mark Winterbottom. There's no way... ...that he wants to buy into that battle. Techno Autosports. Steve Hellam is still carrying that uh, injury from his little shunt on a bicycle a couple of weeks ago. Heartbreak for those fellas at Bathurst after an unbelievable performance. The pole and then in a commanding position all day and then the drama leaving the pit box late in the race. But they did make a statement about pace and teamwork, and they also tidied that car up a lot. Right at the very beginning of the weekend, it was a horror story. Yeah. And the drivers were complaining bitterly and semi-petrified. Gee, they did a good job on the weekend. They certainly did, and the highs and lows of motorsport, wasn't it, with the pit stop and the drama with the restart for him end up being put out. The car failure, so... 64 laps of 102. Win Cup leads. We've reached a critical moment in this race. It's the moment where they can fill up, put tyres on, and potentially get to the chequered flag without another stop. And accordingly, Red Bull Racing Australia and the Holden Commodore have responded. Car number one is in, the race leader. He's got a margin of 7.4 seconds. But while we're in the break, they also did the same thing with Chaz Mostert. And I'll explain it in more detail after we process this stop. So nice, clean entry here for one. Van Gisbergen's gone through in the lead, meantime. Green tyres at the ready. That means brand spankers. They're all doing the same. 47, Tim Slade. We're expecting Winterbottom in as well. Clear, 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 clear. 
So there you go. They've also done the same thing with car number two. Now we want to show you the replay of car six. They came in, they were the first to get to that critical moment. Remember they did one tire and a bit of fuel not very long ago? So now they've put all four on and filled it back up. But the value of coming in earlier and putting a squirt of fuel in, you don't spend as long returning the car to full in this particular stop. Oh, no, that's not nice. He doesn't need that. So strategically, the advantage of stopping earlier means not standing still as long to bring it back to full, to get to the critical lap, to get you home. And we can't afford too much of that. In fact, that, that's very yeah. likely to have done some uh, steering damage to that car. So we might have to revise what I was about to say here, that they were very well positioned as a result of that. They were on the lead lap. The reason why they did it the way they did was that if they had to bring the car back to full from a lower tank position, they were in danger of going a lap down again. That's right. So that was a little risk mitigation play. And Lowndes also getting his stop process. There's his team mate going through. And a bit of damage on the front of car two there. In fact, I reckon the front split is dragging on Garth Tander's car and looks like it might be semi-folded. So there's a few little cracks appearing in the game later in this race for different people. That's quite a lot of damage in the front left-hand corner of Garth Tander's car. And clearly that's a tyre bundle that he's whacked. There it is. That will definitely... That's just a, a bit of smoke there that's too. Drama. I can hear yeah. it in the background. It's actually rubbing on the, on the road pretty substantially. So what's the state of Mostert's car, I wonder? Well, that's the game changer, isn't it? Because... And what he did, by coming in like that, he forced everyone else to go with him. So everybody now with final stop made, fresh tyres on, filled to the end... Van Gisbergen on track. He's the current leader from Winterbottom. Winterbottom about to come in. He'll have to come in soon. So they've just warned Garth, no more contact left front because he's got more than enough damage there at the moment. He'll be able to hear that. He'll probably be able to feel it as well. He certainly noticed the change in audio in the car and race controller observing this. There's actually nothing flapping or broken. I don't think race control is likely to intervene, but you can see the scuff marks where it's clobbered the tyres. It's just starting to vibrate now as well. And uh, they've got a couple of band-aids at the ready in case things get ugly down there with that car, just to make sure that they've got it covered. They don't need that. They've been pretty speedy during the day as we go back now to car number one. This is Jamie Wincup, he's seventh. He's in pretty good shape. So Van Gisbergen, last stop on lap 51. They're stretching this load of fuel. You need to sit down and work out the implications of what happens when he stops. But when he does stop, he'll be a fast car with young tyres right, in a shorter window. But how far back does he get buried when he stops at the moment? Well, let's see who he's racing. So he's got a margin of 5.1 seconds over Mark Winterbottom, and he's 23 seconds at the moment in front of Jamie Wincup. There's a replay up the top end of the circuit on the exit of Turn 11, and uh, this is car 34, a Greg Ritter driving that car in fifth at the moment. He's just wiped the mirror off, no big deal. So, the pace at the moment is very interesting because Winkup, who was doing qualifying laps prior to the stop, fresh tyres now. Van Gisbergen is doing what Winkup was doing before. He's trying to eke out the lead. And... So this will be Greg Ritter confirming that he's staying in the car. Now the transit time in the pit lane here is 36 seconds plus the stationary time. Keep those numbers in the back of your head. Jamie Wincup, meantime, new fastest lap of the race. Greg Ritter, car 34 on screen. The car drops, you're right to go. Mark Winterbottom's pace is not good enough. Now his fastest lap is a 12.63. Wincup's fastest lap is an 11.85. 
just not fast enough. And uh, Gisbergen and Winterbottom, unless they get a big break with the safety car, are going to have to stop again. We're on board with Frosty, position two, 5.87 seconds from the lead. Tim Slade's just done the fastest lap. Crompo with an 11.72 on the previous lap. So don't discount that little group with Lowndes and Slade. They've shown good pace. So we're going to take a quick break. We're doing numbers here everywhere. Lap 71 of 102, then Gisbergen leads. Welcome back to the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600. And whilst we're in the break, Shane Van Gisbergen makes a critical stop because he needed about seven seconds of E85 to get him home. He's going to put fresh tyres on and he is going to sprint. Wing Cup will be the effective leader. Winterbottom still has to stop, but Van Gisbergen needs to sprint with fresh tyres. So he's just made that stop. It was a nice stop, nice and composed. He's going to come out with about a three second lead. Check this out. In the background will be Wink Up. So the battle is on, the sprint. The final 30 laps. And there they are. One and two. So that's good strategy. If he, if he didn't do it then, he was gone. Great to let Mac 3 replay there. Greg Ritter. We saw him give the fence a little rub a minute ago at turn 11. This is going to make reasonable contact with the Gold Coast sign. And we saw Mostert do the same thing. Those ones are so close to being fed in, meaning that if you slightly further to the left or slightly earlier on the curb, then the car basically is arrested by it. And he luckily just got himself back out back on the coat tire chopper of this amazing precinct and what a sprint we've got in the closing stages a series leader jamie winkup trying to hunt shane van gisbergen down winterbottom still yet to make his final stop he's currently leading from caruso and ash waltz but remember this sprint with van gisbergen and winkup 
is the story in the closing stages, Neil. And lap pace is the thing that's hurting him at the moment, Mark Winterbottom. He last stop on lap number 35. Average fuel range suggests he could get out to about lap 75. You can see we're on 74 now, but remember the safety car intervention for David Reynolds for a few laps there. You get about half a lap back for every lap of safety car, so there's a little stretch there, but uh, any tick of the clock, we'll see this car in now for its top up to full and its final set of Dunlop soft tyres to get him home as well. But, but pace is the question mark here. And for pace, Wing Cup has just done the fastest lap of the race, an 11.56, and he is only 1.8 seconds behind Ben Gisberg. And this is this great battle with Slade and Lowndes. They've been battling in, just in behind Tander. They're the next in the run between Ben Gisbergen, Wing Cup, then Tander, Lowndes, Slade. Mostert is the next car in behind Slade. So these cars have got similar age tyres on them, but the way that Slade's car is behaving at the moment looks like it's got pace and he's putting it to good use and he's down the inside. That was a very nice move, Tim Slade. He got through the chicane quickly. He's got a little bit of damage on the passenger side door there. I mean, everybody's given those tyres a wipe on the exit of turn two. Look, even you know, Lowndes' car's got... In fact, I'd suggest that Lowndes' car is carrying a little wound there because tyre condition and early lap speed shouldn't be any great difference, but something has made Craig Lowndes a little vulnerable there. But good job, Tim Slade. Nice move. Car number 360, and James Moffat is in 18th at the moment, minus the mirror cover on that car. And they're getting ready now for Mark Winterbottom, the race leader. 10.4 second margin over Michael Caruso. So he's uh, heading north, halfway up the back straight at the moment in that high-speed chicane. Turn 11. What he will have is very good tyre condition for this last blast. But I'm interested, Neil, they'll have to make a, a chassis tune at this stop because it's, it just has not got the lap pace at the moment. A 12.63 is his fastest lap. His teammate, Chaz Mostert, has done an 11.91, only a few laps ago. So at this stage, it's just, in terms of sprinting, if you have to sprint to the end, which is just about to come in and put four tyres on, it just has not got the outright pace. Very strange. They've had great race pace through the year. He's having a think about getting ready with the anti-roll bar. See his left hand, just making a little position shift there. And he's looking on the dash for the corresponding setting because he knows with fresh tyres he can fight with a more aggressively set car. They're making a change to it. They are making a change to the ride height on that car. Green rears. So he's also wanting a little mirror adjustment. Plenty going on. Can you do fuel, wheels and tyres? Do my rear ride height while we're at it. And hey, what about my mirror? There he goes. He's fueled and done now to the end of the race. And he drops in behind his teammate. Michael Caruso is actually the leader of the race, but the best placed man at the moment is Shane Van Gisbergen. Join us for a thrilling conclusion.
Tim Slade, is fifth on the road at the moment, and we are riding with him. Welcome back to the Gold Coast. This is the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600, and he's hungry for what could be a spot on the podium here, Tim Slade. Is this the one that he's been due for for some time? To do it, he's got to grab effectively his teammate, Garth Tander. That's the man in the foreground, the Holden Racing Team entry, who's carrying a wound in the front left-hand corner of the number two car. Hear that front wing just scuffing in the background. The front bumper assembly's been tweaked on the tyre bundles, most likely the exit of turn two. Michael Caruso still to stop. Car number 36, he last stopped on uh, lap number 52. And we're looking here, I believe, for Craig Lowndes, who's made a mistake and run wide at turn 12. There he goes. And uh, gone down the road there to the milk bar for a Red Bull, perhaps, but got himself back on and cost himself five seconds in the process sure what's happening with Lowndes at the moment because we've seen a number of cars just file by him I think for whatever reason it's got no pace he must be carrying a little bit of damage to the steering on that car or some other problem but uh, the pace that he had early in the day it's just not there meantime that was his teammate Jamie Winkup fastest laps for him they've been impressive one minute 11.5 new fastest lap of the race for him a lot of people putting up big pressure and good pace together here at the moment including Mark Winterbottom who's just done his own personal best. So that answers one question. The little change to the car, did it help? I'd say yes, he's just done a 12-4 on the last lap. Listening to us down there at the Holden Racing Team at the moment is the team uh, teammate, I should say, to Garth Tander. G'day, young James. Uh, this is a bit interesting, isn't it? It's starting to get a bit exciting here. It so, is. So uh, GT's looks like he's a uh, bit of a battle tank there. He's carrying a bit of, uh, a bit of damage. Slater's thing is in a bit better shape, that's for sure. It's a hard gig, this one, isn't it, James? When you get to the end of the race here, particularly if you're carrying a bit of a battle scar, uh, it's not a place that's easy to carry a car like a traditional racetrack. No, that's right, Neil. You know, around here, you're always thinking about it. If, it, if that component fails, um, around here, there's no margin for error. Like, you can't just run onto the grass. It's going to be a big one. So GT will have that in the back of his mind. Slady will know about that. So he'll be pressing him, trying to push him on, making him use and take those little bits of risk, trying to get him to hit tyres, even though we're teammates, you're still pushing on. Uh, so there's a bit of a mind game going on here, so uh, we'll see what happens. Hey James, it looks like it's gone a little bit worse, don't you think? The left hand front damage there, yeah, that air dam's definitely lower. Yeah, exactly, and the boy's been on to GT, trying to get him to not touch the tyres as much as he can, try and stay away from them to uh, to minimise, you know, making that, that uh, damage even greater, but you can see the headlights are just, um, you know, pretty bad there at the moment. So that's going to be affect the aerodynamics um, it can be pretty sketchy in the high-speed stuff, but uh, he's doing a great job, and it's a good little battle here. Slady's due for a cracking result. He's had a tough season. Um, I'm sure he wants to get past old mate GT here. I was, we were been talking about the same thing because he is due for a good result, and he's driving very well. I've been really impressed with him over the weekend. Yeah, he's, he's been going really good all year, just really bad luck. Um, you know, I felt, felt bad for Slady. He's come over to Walkinshaw and... and um, you know, it should theoretically be a lot better for him, but he's just had a tough year, but the speed's been really good, so a result today would be perfect for him. But on the other hand, we need GT up on the podium, so it'd be good if the two boneheads in the front run into each other, then bang, one, two for us. <laughs> they speak highly of you too, James. Hey, just quickly before you do, but... I don't know, shame winning. Are you going to be OK to turn 22 around and have it on the grid for tomorrow? Yeah, we're not too sure on what it was. Merce mechanical ability isn't that flash, so uh, he just said it, it's broken. <laughs> uh, so the boys will have a look at it when we get it back tonight. But, you know, we've pretty much got spare cars here, you know, all in pieces. So the boys will pull everything apart and work out what it is and change it overnight. We'll be fine. Thanks, James. We'll catch up with you later. James Cheers, Courtney, Lance. Holden Racing Team there. And uh, Craig Lowndes has come in. He's reporting he can't turn left. So there's something wrong with the steering. You, you were saying before, he just won't turn left. So he's bumped something. Very easy, this place to alter the wheel alignment settings and effectively the corner weights if you run over a curb too hard. There you go. 
Yeah, boys, prior to the stop, I had a quick chat to Jeremy Moore, and they said that Craig was struggling with balance of the car because prior to this pit stop, they only changed the rears uh, in, on the car, so he was struggling with balance, and they and that was the reason for his slower lap times. There was a report, yes, I can see that tyre has been flat spotted, um, and, and the front, uh, so the front right tyre has been flat spotted, so that was the reason for the pit stop. Yeah, I was just trying to listen to their uh, radio comms in the background there. So it's a bit unred bull like this stop as well. Thanks, Rihanna. Uh, they're now changing that air dam, as you can see. He's been off the road down the escape road. I reckon this is a couple of times. And they're still having a chat about it back there in the lane at the moment. So Craig's dropping valuable spots here. He's got no pace. So they definitely had to address it, no question about that. Meantime, the battle at the front of the field is looking pretty interesting at the moment because the pressure's on. Wind Cup's using everything to try and get the margin reduced. 1.6 seconds is the gap between Van Gisbergen and Tanda. Look at that tyre damage there. That's off Jamie Wind, uh, correction, off uh, Craig Lowndes' car. So there's a lot of screaming and yelling going on down there at the moment as they try and figure out the problem. I'm here with Steve Hallam, who runs the operation with the Shane Van Gisbergen car. Jamie Winkup trying to come at you hard, Steve, but look, you've got, you got tyres, you've got fuel, you've got a fast car, you've got a great driver in there at the minute. You're in pretty good shape today. Yeah, we're just trying to manage the gap at the moment. Uh, with this the, being the circuit that it is, anything can happen, but as we sit here now talking to you, we're under control. We just hope to uh, preserve that to the end of the, uh, end of the race. Just got to watch for the traffic as well. Mate, I can't give you enough praise. You've come here, you've turned around this great little team, and it's a single car team, and people need to understand how difficult it is for a smaller operation. But gee whiz, everywhere you turn up now, you're on the money, and you should be very proud of what you've achieved here, mate. Well, that's because we have a great team here. You do. We really do. Well and done. all of them deserve the credit. Well done. And they've recovered from the lowest of lows at Bathurst after being in such a commanding position. Meantime, Wind Cup continues to move the margin here. Fastest lap of the race for him. The gap seesaws backwards and forwards. Look at this. Mistake by Wind Cup on the Gillette replay down there at turn one. And the tyre age is a question here because for Van Gisbergen, the tyres on his car are six laps younger than the tyres on Jamie Wind Cup's car. So it's remarkable that Wind Cup is still squeezing performance at the moment, although we've just seen that little mistake. And in fact, as a result of that now, that gap that I was talking up is just stretched. We want to pass him, we have to pass him. So 2.6 seconds is that margin now. And that was the message to Tim Slade, we've got to pass him. Slady at the moment is position four. Garth Tander, who's pretty seasoned at this stuff, doing long, disciplined races and not blinking. It's something that you learn as a craft when you're one of the guys that's been doing it for a long time. That really disciplined, mistake-free driving is what he's trying to produce at the moment, Garth Tander. And at present, he's on the podium. Yeah, on with you, Neil. You can't say enough about Garth Tander in these sorts of circumstances. We look at that, we're talking about the gap you guys are talking about, the front of his car that's affecting his aero. And just without getting too technical, that car works at the front because of the low pressure underneath the front of the car, the diffuser, the underwing, if you like. And those cracks you can see right on screen there as uh, the BOC car off down the back there. Uh, those little open gaps around the headlights in the front of the car there bleed air into the car and they start to neutralise the pressure, even send high pressure in there. That would be a difficult car to drive and that's when you need a guy like Garth Tender in there to drive it. Yeah, exactly right. Sorry, Neil. That's exactly right. And what you were... Neil was talking about it earlier, Larko, about the level of front grip and how important it is around here. We also heard James Courtney say the same thing because even that fast chicane at the back, it's about 145 kilometres an hour, mid-corner speed there. Very easy just to bump the tyres. And as we can see, more and more damage to the front of the Garth Pandemobile. That, that mess there that we were seeing on the Gillette replay was Jason Bright. Meantime, problem here with the front end also of the Wilson Security, Dick Johnson Racing Ford, car oh, 17, in. David Wall. Oh. That was close at 12. It's going to go under the front of the car. He won't be able to steer it if it actually ends up under those front wheels. So he needs to slow down. Remember that, remember that David got caught at Bathurst on lap two, day one of practice when a tyre let go. He said the car felt strange, but he was still doing well into the 200 kilometres an hour. He had a big moment there. He just needs to take it gently, and now he's home. 
So just to explain that, we saw it come out of turn 11. This is why it's got the damage. So this is the fast chicane. I'm just saying about the mid-corner speed, roughly 145 kilometers an hour. It catches the tyre bundle, tears the bottom out of the air dam, and then we saw it at turn 11. He come down the next straight, he turned left, and that air dam then folded back in under the tyre. So momentarily you have no grip. So the friction level under the car at that stage, under the tyre, wouldn't turn left for him. He just got away with it. We saw Dave Reynolds crash there earlier. A lot of damage to the right front of 17. Gap is stabilising between Van Gisbergen and Wind Cup at the moment. Uh, they're very, very close in their sector splits as we go back to the Dick Johnson racing entry and they're going to pluck that front wing off. That's the item that Mark Larkin was accurately describing there a few moments ago. Fresh one Mate, set to go. Work on that. Okay, this is uh, ending what's been a good campaign between yeah, David and Stephen in. Johnson. These are the biggest problem makers just trying to uh, you know, just keep it squared up all the time. Meantime, Jason Bright has continued after that little drama we saw for him down at Turn 4. He's 17. And has uh, Slade got clear of Tander? He has. So Tim Slade, that's a telling shot, has now got by Garth Tander, who looks like he's got his hands full here. And uh, here... Oh, here's what happened. Wow, that looks wild, doesn't it? When Tim's on the racetrack on the race line and Garth goes straight ahead. So he's got a little drama here. He's had to roll out of it. So a valiant effort by Garth Tander, but in the end, it's got worse. As you said, Mark, the front left corner of that car's got its drop. And uh, that's allowed Tim Slade onto the podium here, potentially. A provisional call, that one. And Tony Delberto, he's in conversation there uh, with Oliver Gavin. So... Uh, oh, it's killed the tyre. It's actually punctured the tyre. Now, the, uh, now Garth's got to draw on all of that experience to just ease the thing back gently. It's been getting a rub for the best part of 15 laps. I suggestion would be that it's just basically pierced the... ...voice of Garth Tander. So he's trying to give them as much information as he can because they're trying to determine whether they just put a new air dam on it or do they need to jump underneath it and do other rectification work. And Garth's smart enough to know that you've just got to take all the speed out of it when it's like this. Just get yourself back home gently. 2.6 seconds meantime. Bit of traffic in the game here between Van Gisbergen and, and Wind Cup. Uh, car number 14 involved here. Fabian Coulthard's at the helm at the moment. And Fabian is 11th and he's a lap down. So I doubt whether he'll put up too much resistance. And car number 21's got a bad sportsmanship flag. Dale Woods 15th at the moment. He's been giving those curves a bit of a belting. That's the view towards the south, down towards Cool and Gadda. This will help Mostert. That'll get him to fourth position started 19th so it's a great run after going a lap down early in the race they fought back very very well russell engel also a very good job he's actually gained now 16 positions from his starting spot of 25 so now van gisbergen down the inside that's been a costly 60 seconds of van gisbergen's life because in the last minute jamie wincup's been able to peel the best part of a second out of him that's because of the traffic. There he is in the background. Sometimes there's that, you can be fooled by those numbers, though, because then Jamie's got to deal with the traffic as well. Sometimes it tends to equalise, although often when you're the first guy in the queue, you spend longer clearing lapped cars than the subsequent drivers because then the, the guy that's uh, a lap or two down has been alerted to the fact that the traffic's around him. They tend to be more courteous as the as they realise what's happening around them. Well, they're used to it then, aren't they? Yeah. So, really, Van Gisbergen's had to forge his way through there. You'll find now Fabian will move over. And I think uh, 14's actually due in this lap because Fabian last stopped on lap uh, 51. So, Brad Jones was gambling on a, uh, on a safety car there to be able to... That was the one that we spoke about earlier that, that really 
meant you're the best part of nine or ten laps shy of being able to get home from lap uh, from that lap but you needed big safety car intervention that was the one that i spoke about a bit earlier you needed if not one then two of them for a chunky period of time so pretty remember, optimistic strategy uh, exactly it needed that for sure but remember neil now wink cup's trying to fight with older tires so 65 was the lap that he came in on and then being gisberg and as you said on 71 so the six laps of tire life in terms of being able to sprint will be very difficult for Jamie Winkup to wear him down. 1.8 seconds in arrears. Slade, as we saw, great job to get himself onto the bottom of the podium. Dalberto never been on the podium, so that's a great result for Tony Dalberto and Tim Slade if they can hang in. Roughly 10 laps to go. Just behind them was Mostert and Winterbottom, Caruso, McLaughlin, Pye, Ingle, and Tanda. I just want to say what a ripping job young Scott Pye and Ash Walsh have done. We haven't sort of seen much of them, but they've, they've been up there and thereabouts. Very respectable lap times. I reckon those guys, and they're both ripping young blokes, uh, have done a top job. And, mate, the other little man of the match for me today is our director, Nathan. What a great shot of that, that light rail we have up here now. Like, it's blazing along there at, say, 40 k's an hour. It's three feet out the window. Car goes past at 240 k's an hour. <laughs> hey, you listen to Inglebert Hunkerdink on your iPod. And, wow! <laughs> Yeah. Amazing images that you see around here. <laughs> so, uh, bad sportsmanship flag for car number one over use of the curbs, Jamie Wincup. And we also had a bad sportsmanship flag for Chaz Mostert over use of the curbs. So, you got to be careful here, boys. There we go. Confirmation on screen. Look at the amount of damage and the tape on the front of Garth Tander's car. This could be all good news for Tim Slade, the way things are playing out here. He was last on the podium at Winton. He got a third place. And we've talked about the drought that he's been through. And he's on target to eclipse his previous best fourth place here on the coast. And as you said a moment ago, scaping for Tony Delberto, this is a big breakthrough. Hasn't had a V8 supercar podium, period, let alone on the Gold Coast. And he's been a regular runner in the series until recently, Tony Delberto, former Dunlop Series champion. And uh, he operated a small but very effective team for a long period of time. So Tanda, despite having to be stationary for some time to patch that car, is in the top ten. That's valuable points for him. But he's carrying all that damage and uh, around they go. So that's a uh, strategic positional move, is it? Yep. For Winterbottom and Mostert. And Mostert and Winkup, who are the guys charging, were the guys that were just given the bad sportsmanship flag. So. That's a smart move there for them to just use their brain. Don't demand too much of young Chaz in the last part of this race. And he's now gone back to sixth position. Martin Caruso has done a great job. Currently fifth. He'll be pressuring Mark Winterbottom in the closing stages also. So strategy-wise, it looks like Techno Autosports have put together a good strong sequence here stops on lap 35 they took jonathan webb out of the car then double stinting shane van gisbergen stopped on 51 then stopped again on lap 71 and then good young tires and quick driver and a fast car have worked well for them 2.6 seconds is the gap here's tander he's 10. chasing ingle in front of ritter and uh, jamie wincup is just checking gaps around him now because I think that he's spent his penny. Now it's just about trying to be able to come home in the best possible position. Is that currently second? Yeah, he's actually even a gear up just then. He didn't even go back to the what was a normal gear selection for there. He just said to David Couchy, I can't race anymore. And as you said, Neil, he's looking for where the next car in the queue is, Slade. Is 17 and a half seconds in a rear, so he's fine with that. And there's the brains trust with Mark Dutton in the middle, David Couchy on the radio. We heard them very vocal at the previous race meeting at Bathurst as both of those guys tried to coax Jamie to the end of the great race. And that's the exact message there 17.9 to the car behind. And just trying to get all the information. This game is about. The communication with those key people to 
coaxed the driver through those zones of the race and now 3.2 seconds behind Van Gisbergen. Wink Cup can't sprint. He's on the cusp of curb overuse. He's been given a bad sportsmanship flag. He's had a phase of the race. He's got older tyres and he cannot at this point run at the Van Gisbergen pace. This is uh, Scott Pye here at the moment. Mark Larkin made mention of this entry before. Behind Scott McLaughlin and in front of uh, Russell Ingle. And uh, this is a nice recovery from them as well because uh, it was a traumatic Mount Panorama weekend a couple of weekends ago at Bathurst for them. It's a bit of an idea, of the, uh, idea I should say, of the margins here. This is uh, Russell Ingle in ninth position, car 23, borrowed car. So uh, Gary Rogers Motorsport car, remember Russell was unfortunately involved in that incident at the end of Mountain Straight. And uh, meantime, Rick Kelly is just asking his crew to have a look at his car. He's down in 20th, car 15 at the moment. Jack Daniels, Nissan, he thinks he might have had a little rub with the wall. So drivers just a bit nervous at the back end of the race, wanting to make sure that they can quietly sneak home now and get points and be classified. harder than it sometimes seems, Neil. I don't know about you guys, but if I could summarise today's race, I actually think there's been too much self-inflicted damage, too many guys belting tyres. Now, that's really easy for me to say standing here in pit lane, but, you know, part of good race driving is not only being fast, but there's got to be an element of risk management in there, if you like. And you, know, you, just, you just can't be flamboyant and throw the cars at the tyres. And there's been too many guys transit through the lane today with broken suspension and front bars in particular has peeled off the car. Yeah, 100% like Owen. If you have a look at Van Gisbergen and Winkup's car, currently first and second, they've got the least amount of damage. So they've done a really good job of, as you said, minimising the risk. And you've got to know when to press on. You've got to know when you've got to use that speed. And, oh, a little rub there for Holtworth. This is for position. So um, that was a bit cheeky. Lee was trying to get up the left side of Greg Ritter. And for a moment there, she made me sit up and stop because it's like oh, if that continues we'll see a car rotate but it didn't and in fact Fabian's in this as well so this little battle here 11, 12 and 13 is a real battle, no lap cars involved these guys are playing for keeps each of them have got some stories to tell because for Greg Ritter he's looking to stake a claim for more regular driving either in this category or another for Lee Holdsworth they just desperately need a decent weekend the last couple for them have been just mega painful and for Fabian Coulthard well he in the early part of this championship year was a genuine championship contender so he needs every point he can get at the moment to get back in the game a little because he's just lost touch uh, in the recent past so he slipped back to sixth in the championship coming into this race so these fellows are all playing a hard game here at the moment I reckon Greg Ritter does an amazing job oh look at this Lee's got a run on him bit of and Lee's lit up on the radio pretty hard here. He reckons he's just dropped the spot too. So uh, blood pressure's gone up inside Lee Holdsworth's helmet. And in fact, all that sequence of blowing up on the radio and having a bit of a jostle there has now cost him a spot. So uh, the reason he's aggravated is because I was about to make comment on it that it looked like Greg changed direction a couple of times. So it looked like weaving. You're allowed to change direction once. They, they usually start to get a little bit animated at race control if you make a second manoeuvre. It wasn't an overt one, but it was a gesture towards if you move, I'm going to cover you. Replay from above. The chopper shows a bit of the story here. Yeah. Uh, it's very close to being out of order. Mm. What do you reckon? Well, it was a little shift across, close. wasn't it? It was yeah. close. Coulthard now gets that move made. And that is for 11th position. Ritter now is vulnerable to Holdsworth. Holdsworth fires down the inside. He'll get that done too. And he'll, he'll and probably escort him wide just to... <laughs> I was going to say, what he's going to do here is cut him absolutely no favours. He's going to edge him up to Mr. Concrete and introduce him. So Van Gisbergen, 4.3 seconds in front of Winkup. Slade, great job. Third, Mark Winterbottom. Michael Caruso, Chaz Mostert, Scott McLaughlin, Scott Pye, Russell Ingle, Garth Tander. That's your top ten. Scott Pye and Ingle, they've both gained roughly 15 spots, so they've done a really good job through the course of the day. 
Mostert, great fight back from the early problems. Winterbottom, on a day when you're not fast enough, has got himself to the back of the podium to fourth position and has done a really good job in terms of his title chase versus Jamie Winkup. But Winkup is now going to stretch his championship lead. He's going to be plus 300 points after this, which means that he's a weekend clear. It's a nice position to be in as we join him. He's up in turn 12, second gear. He's a machine. He played a tough game at Bathurst. He wasn't interested in conservation. It was all about making pace, and we've seen evidence of it quite a number of times this year at Eastern Creek when it was wet. Yeah. He was driving hard. He wasn't interested at all in some sort of, well, let's just stroll home and preserve things. Dave Couchy on the radio in the background, giving him the margins. It's uh, 4.3 seconds is the gap between he and this man here. So Shane Van Gisberg, and you had a glimpse of Win Cup in the background there, and Tim Slade is still lurking along nicely in third position. And the interesting thing, Neil, is he's driving to the gap. The gap's leaking a bit at the front, roughly 4.3 seconds, as you said. But Slade's backed it off also a bit now. So where it was 17 and a half, it's 18.8. So Slade's backed off in unison with Wing Cup, so he doesn't have to press on. Which won't necessarily be all driver either. Some of it will be tyre, because those guys pushed very hard in the first part of their stint on their tyres. Which means that They've taken a little bit more out of them. And one of the concerns with the softer tyre around here, unlike the harder Dunlop tyre, which tends to be uh, very good in terms of its tyre wear, they start with a little under four millimetres of total tread depth at the beginning of their life. The softer tyre, you actually do hook into the tread depth. Yeah. So what they don't want to do is end up in the last few laps of this race oh. with, with next to no tread depth. Uh, once they reach that point in the tyre line, it is literally like switching off the grip on the tyre. And uh, Slade could be vulnerable here at the moment. He just doesn't look overly speedy, does he? You are fine on the fuel. You are fine on the fuel. behind you in the position. Yeah, so that's the first little warning there for Tim Slade. Just beware. And so lap speed for the boys. Tim Slade last lap was a 13.8, 12.7 for Mark Winterbottom. So that's not good. If you're Tim Slade, who stopped on lap 65, but remember that Winterbottom stopped on 75, so the age of the tyres has got a, a bit to do with this. So Mark Winterbottom has got a bad sportsmanship flag, so he's got no more lives left. If he does it again, he'll end up with a penalty. So, gee, there's always a story, isn't there? So Slade, he's at the end of his tether with rubber, but conversely, Mark Winterbottom, he's at the end of the tether in terms of what he can get away with with curb hops. Neither one of them needs to make any mistakes here because the next guy that could benefit is Michael Caruso. Right and there, there he is in the background. Slade is really struggling. He's got no grip. You can tell he's having to slow the car down a lot in the mid corner. And uh, there's car seven in the pit lane at the moment as well. Todd Kelly's in there for some service. And Slade almost crashed at the left-hander where we saw Dave Reynolds make contact with the fence. So they've just uh, grabbed the first and just advised Mark Winterbottom, you've got no more lives left when it comes to the kerb. So here we are at the critical spot. It's not this one, it's this one here at 2G. Used a lot of it again, oh. though. He's pushing hard. He's got the eyes on. He's trying to grab Tim Slade. Meantime, at the other end of the racetrack, Shane Van Gisbergen is looking strong. And this is a nice response after all that happened to him at Mount Panorama. Gee, you need to look in every direction here, folks. But right now, it's all about Shane Van Gisbergen. We'll get back to the battle in position three in a moment. The Kiwi rounds up the final corner. He's into drifting, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. It's a flamboyant blast to the flag in second gear sideways for the 25-year-old Kiwi. Shane Van Gisbergen is the winner of part one of the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600. Meantime, the battle for third continues. Tim Slade doing everything he can to survive. And he's got Frosty jamming it into him in the last corner. He can't bump and run, that might cause some tears. He's trying to get up the inside. It'll be neck and neck. Slade to the right, Frosty to the left, and Frosty grabs him at the line. Frosty grabs him at the line.
drive. There will be drama attached to that. Winterbottom had made contact. He pushed him all the way out of the final corner. Finally, when they gathered themselves up, got themselves straight, Winterbottom, in the dying, closing metres of this race, gets by Tim Slade to get onto the podium. Van Gisbergen with his fourth win for the year. Great drive. Jamie Winkup, great championship drive from our series leader. And Winterbottom, only one position behind. Those guys come into the weekend, 297 points apart, first to second. And Winkup will have just made that lead leak out a little bit again. As Neil said, when you can get more than a 300 point lead, a complete weekend's points, always a very nice feeling to win the championship. And this man, what a great drive. Good strategy from his team. We saw him on the last lap there, slide this car all the way out of there. Fantastic. This guy is a real performer. And he's delivered today after the heartbreak at Mount Panorama. He moves his career victory tally on to eight. And for this season, he moves it on to four victories. And this is a critical one. He gets maximum points. Tied in fourth coming into the weekend with James Courtney. And so he's now getting the boost in the points that he deserved. Was an awesome effort. And a brilliant drive also by Jamie Winkup. And look at Jonathan Webb. It's absolutely thrilled, as he should be. Well done, boys. VIP Pet Foods, Techno Auto Sports for Steve Hallam, for Jeff Slater, the engineer. And we'd like to invite viewers around Australia now to switch to Seven Mate for continued coverage of the V8s here on the Gold Coast. That is with the exception of our viewers in Western Australia. As we welcome viewers now around Australia on 7, mate, and for our Western Australian viewers on 7, thanks for staying with us. All the action of race number 31 has just wound up. The first of two big 300-kilometre events. Shane Van Gisbergen, if you've just joined us, fast Kiwi together with his teammate Jonathan Webb has cleaned up by a margin of just over two seconds from series leader and reigning champion Jamie Wincup and Paul Dumbrell. Nice job, Mark Winterbottom and Steve Owen for position number three. It keeps his championship hopes alive, although he's some way back now in the points tally. And there are quite a number of people who'll be frustrated by what's happened to them today, Scafi. I certainly will. And James Courtney there, obviously, with the DNF, with the incident with Greg Murphy at the start. Shane Van Gisberg and the heartbreak of the Bathurst 1000 is two weeks ago, but this, it must mean a lot to you. Yeah, just over the moon, and Webby did a good job. Car was straight and fast, and then we played a pretty different strategy there, but I didn't really know what was going to happen where Jamie was going to come out, but um, once we come out in front, just managed the gap, but um, car's fantastic. Thank you. Jonathan Webb, team owner and a superstar co-driver as well. What does this mean to this small team? Oh, you know, it's massive for all the boys. We such heartache last weekend. And, you know, we knew we had the speed. We knew we had the team to do it. Just didn't quite put it together. But, no, today the boys have done a sensational job. Shane's done you know, as he always does. And, uh, yeah, just ecstatic. Shane, once again, yourself and Jamie Winkup here on the streets of the Gold Coast. You two boys, you love it here. Yeah, my burnout was average, though. I have to do a better one tomorrow. But, um, yeah, we had a great race with Jamie a few years ago, and it was a bit of a reversal then. But, um, yeah, really, really good to get back on the points again and back on top step and a good surfboard. Pole position, a win here on the streets of the Gold Coast. You boys, you get to enjoy the champagne. Congratulations. We will. Thank you. And we head over here to the boys at Red Bull Racing Australia. Paul Dumbrell will look for your driver, Jamie Wink, up in a second. But PD, another tough race here on the Gold Coast. Yeah, no, how was it? It was pretty crazy out there with the curbs uh, and the tyres down the back straight. But uh, the car actually looks quite straight, which is actually quite good. So um, obviously we didn't have the pace uh, there of uh, Shane and the Webby there towards the end. But um, you know, great for the championship, second place. You know, obviously after uh, uh, Bathurst, great way to bounce back. And uh, can't wait for tomorrow. Do it all again. And, and your driver, Jamie, where is he? I know. Uh, I actually don't know. He's actually run to the toilet. So uh, it's a long stint in there and uh, it's quite hot. So uh, hey, he's probably just relieving himself uh, out the back there. Too much information, <laughs> Peter. We don't need to know this sort of stuff. We need to speak to Mark Winterbottom. It was a controversial end to that last lap on that ra of that race. Mark Winterbottom, I'm not sure if you've been told, but actually you have been relegated to fourth position. You are not third on the podium. Yeah, right. That's, uh, 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, he was trying to back me up a little bit coming out of that last corner. So, um, yeah, the old Ford engine had a bit more grunt, but uh, here's what it is. We'll uh, finish fourth. and um, uh, But, yeah, good good day. We battled through, and, uh, yeah, it's good to fight. So, anyway, here's what it is. Thanks, Frosty. Cheers. Wow, how's that for a story? Oh. So, Mark Winterbottom off the podium. Here's the replay. I described it as a bump and run, and it bothered me at the time. And it was because he set Tim sideways on the final corner. That gave him the run that he needed. And then he got by by the narrowest of margins. And uh, they've responded. Driving standards observer Jason Barguana has looked at this and decided to add, I think, I'm only just catching up with the messages. They're flying around the precinct at the moment. But I think they've added five seconds to Frosty's time here. Look at this. So this and it went on for a while. So it wasn't just a little innocent tap. I mean, clearly, Frosty was pushing extremely hard. He's trying to get every point that he can get. And equally, Tim Slade, he's wanting to get on the podium after a brave drive this afternoon. So race control have seen it that way. And uh, Tim Slade pretty upset and angry there. And uh, Tony Delberto, his teammate, just consoling him. I reckon his day will brighten up when he realises he's finished third. And there at Cam's race control is Jason Barguana. Michael Massey is off to his left, our right. So it's a busy scene in there, Rihanna. Tony Delberto, roller coaster of emotions in a, in a few minutes. You are now a V8 Supercar podium winner. You are third place on the podium. Finally! <laughs> oh, I was pretty upset there at the end. It was a little bit uh, naughty of Frosty there, but uh, it's, it's good to see that we got the position back and uh, Tim drove the best he could and a bit overheated there at the end. So just so wrapped for Walkinshaw Racing and Super Cheap Auto to get a podium. You know, I think we thoroughly deserve it. What does this mean to you after all these years in the V8 Supercar Championship? It's a long time coming, too long, and uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Congratulations, Tony. Get up there and spray the champagne and enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's a weird world, isn't it? It is, and it changes very quickly. So uh, media manager for V8 Supercars, Cole Hitchcock there with Tim Slade, who uh, didn't look too pleased when he went away. Adrian Burgess has been counselling him a lot to try and help him in the recent past. He's with Rihanna. Tim, he's like, I'm not sure if you're actually concentrating on what's happened right now, but Tim, you're third on the podium. Congratulations. Are you feeling OK at the moment? You don't look too well. Not really. Um, I had no, uh, no drink after a few laps and the cool suit wasn't working and the helmet fan wasn't working, so it's not, not nice. But, uh, yeah, stoked, uh, happy for the guys. Um, Okay. Yeah, big big rebuild during the week, and uh, yeah, it's it good. Uh -huh. Timmy, we'll, we'll let you go there. Congratulations. Yeah, well done, Rihanna. It's obviously under a fair bit of duress right now. And here's the replay again of what happened in the closing stages of the race. And um, I saw Tim on the way out of the circuit last night, and I think he told me recently, it might have even been Bathurst, he had a problem with the cool suit. So that's the second time in a couple of races, I think. I'm not 100% sure, but here's what happened. Mark Winterbottom, that contact through turn 15, just launching the Holden driver sideways, and Slade doing everything he could to hang on but in the end Mark Winterbottom did cross the line in front of him race control were not happy about that move the bump and run is something that they don't tolerate particularly when it's for a position on the podium like that and so as a result they've made a change there they've added five seconds to Mark Winterbottom's time it's changed the result but uh, no changing what's happened there in terms of the boys at Techno Autosports and VIP Pet Foods Shane Van Gisbergen and Jonathan Webb the teammates they've done an awesome job haven't they so it's been a busy day as always. What we want to do now is celebrate the podium with Aaron Noonan. Time for the podium for race 31 of the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600. Introducing first the winners for Team Techno VIP Pet Foods, Shane Van Gisbergen and Jonathan Webb. In second place for Red Bull Racing Australia, Jamie Winkup and Paul Dumbrell. And in third, for Super Chief Auto Racing, Tim Slade and his first V8 podium, Tony Delberto. And representing the winning team, Steve White from Team Techno VIP Pet Foods. To present the third place trophy, the acting mayor, Donna Gates of the city of Gold Coast. Presenting the second place trophies, representing Minister Stuckey, the Honourable John Paul Langbroke, MP, Member for Surface Paradise.
Presenting the winning team award, Paul Blair, the managing director of Armored Auto Group. And to our winners, to represent and present the trophy, Sue Dilger, sponsorship manager for our naming rights back at Castro Lubricants. There you have it, your podium finishes in race 31 of the championship at the Castrol Edge Gold Coast 600. Drivers really treasure these surfboards that they take away from this event. Mark Scaife, you've been able to do it, as have many of the other senior drivers over the years, and a unique and very special trophy. It's great, isn't it? And it's a little nuance of one of the surfing capitals of this country. I'm going to take you through the highlights because what a day's racing that was. Drama at the start for Greg Murphy. Have a look in the background there. He just tried to get by David Russell. They made contact, spun car 22 around and out within two or three car lengths at the start of the race. The safety car was out. At the restart, Paul Dumbrell decided to round everybody up. John Webb was leading. The guys obviously told him to redress. So they made him come back in behind. It was a very healthy battle going on at the front with Dumbrell and John o. Webb. And look at this great two-wheel action that we've seen all day through turns seven, eight, nine, and ten. And all the action coming out of the first chicane. This man did a great job. Alternate strategy. Scott McLaughlin was leading. He put the car back into Premer's hands, and that was a clumsy moment for the two BJR drivers. Brad Jones looking on and a big move down the inside. That was for the lead, and this was also for Chas Mostert to get back on the lead lap. Spinning wheels for car 21 in the pit stop. And then the damage to the front of car 55. David Reynolds was pressing on very hard. Huge amount of damage through there, and then contact with the wall at turn 12. The amount of damage these guys have had over the last few race meetings, in fact, they've had four DNFs in the last six race meetings. Tire changes, strategy unfolding, Mostert trying to get back onto the lead lap, was successful in doing so. Everyone was pressing on, and this was Mostert with a big mistake. He was lucky to get away with that one on the way out of turn two. Huge contact with the fence on the left-hand side. Same with Ritter, exactly the same circumstance. And that Gold Coast tire bundle has taken a pounding. This man, great strategy, applied by Techno for Van Gisbergen and Webb. A lot of damage to the front there of the Wilson Security Falcon. And he almost went in the fence when that folded back in under the tire, got away with it. And that was also a drama for Garth Tander who drove very well to maintain his spot. He was third at that point. Then Slade got by with the damage to the left-hand front. And you could see the reaction there for Tony Dalberto to get himself onto the podium. But the big drift, the big slide, the great car control. We've seen this man turn on some of the best races and best drives of his career this year. Van Gisbergen wins and Winterbottom shoves Slade. He pushes him wide. He gets by. He actually gets to third. That's the reaction from Dalberto. Post-race, penalty for Winterbottom. Off the podium, Slade and Dalberto. They go to the podium. Magnificent job for those guys, and especially those two guys, Webb and Van Gisbergen. Sensational today.